minutes. Um, but I want to give a shout out to Shin Wu out in Taiwan, who's a, a graduate. Uh, Shin just sent the school a whole bunch of masks for safety from Taiwan. What a thoughtful thing. Shin is also uh, on his way back to advanced piano next fall. Had a little bit of a challenge uh, this year because of the challenge that we're all facing, which uh, in a way has set us up for this opportunity to be able to share what we're doing here, what's happening here at North Bennett Street School uh, in this live virtual format. So we're excited to do that. Uh, also want to give a bunch of shout outs to uh, some schools. It's Perino at Madison Park, O'Brien, The Burke, Boston Tech, Cambridge Ringe in Latin, Boston Latin, Belmont Hills, and the Landmark School. We love working with all of you, and there's a ton of other schools that are out there. If you're with us live today, hello and welcome. Uh, schools, community-based organizations, uh, individuals, wherever you are, and I'm going to take this page again from my colleague, Colleen. Uh, put in the chat where you're from. Uh, where are you joining us from? Uh, it's tough on this side uh, to, to really be able to interact with you in a way that if we're in the same room, uh, but there are opportunities to engage in our chat function. Um, so during the time, please, if you have any questions uh, or comments or you wanna share with us what programs you're interested in, uh, just let us know. Um, we're going to try and get to the questions as we can within the flow of the day. Uh, we also have uh, our colleague in admissions, Sharon Stetson. Uh, she is staffing the chat and she will be able to answer some things for you there. Um, and uh, we're just really grateful that you've joined us today. Here we are, just waiting for my, uh, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna, this is me, I'm Rob O'Dwyer. I'm your host uh, with your co-host, Kristen Odell. She's been with us the whole time. She'll be giving a presentation later on today, visiting some graduates. Uh, but right now I'm gonna turn my camera around and uh, introduce you to President Sarah Turner. And, hi Sarah. And good morning. It is so exciting to be talking to so many people out there um, on this day three of our virtual open house. I'm standing here right outside the programs that you'll see today. I'm also standing in Boston's North End, one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, at a trade school that has been teaching craft and trade for 139 years. Um, so we're having a truly kind of historic moment you imagine a school that's been doing what it's doing for 139 years suddenly doing it on zoom and virtually it's very exciting we um, have people coming from all over the country and even though you may be sort of experiencing this by yourself at home at work wherever you are know that you are joined by a full community of people who are interested in many of the same things as you and different things but all things that you'll see over these three days so today, Rob and Kristen are gonna take you to see our carpentry program, our violin making and repair program, and our jewelry making and repair program. I'm standing by some of the most beautiful sawhorses I've ever had the opportunity to stand by. Um, high craft all around, as you will see as we talk to students and faculty uh, midday today, you'll get a chance to do some tours of alumni shops with our alumni. And those tours are going to be happening um, truly virtually and taking advantage of sort of the geography reach that Zoom allows. So I know we'll be seeing some people on the East Coast and in the middle of the country and, and all around. So at noon, you'll get to see um, the people who are out there living and working um, with the benefit of their education from North Bennett. So welcome. I will turn it to Rob and to Kristen, who will take you first to Carpentry. I hope you enjoy the day. And I look forward to seeing you um, at the end of the day today when I'll get to wish everyone well with Rob as we close out three days of virtual programming. Take care, have fun. Thanks, Sarah. We'll see you later. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Sarah. See you later. Bye. Happy 
Happy Wednesday. Hey guys, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Welcome to Carpentry. I'm Peter from Brock. We're gonna do a demo, we're gonna walk you around the classroom in a whole shop space. We have a whole large, massive shop space. It's like a donut. Uh, and you'll see all that. And then we're gonna do demos on coping. So I'm gonna start right in here and we're gonna do crown molding coping. So if we come over to the bench, here's some of the students. Hey everyone. Hey, how's it going everybody? Yep. So crown molding um, has multiple profiles and it goes on the wall. So you're used to seeing it at the top of a wall up against the ceiling, right? And it, you, it can look something like that. So this is like a little model that the students will do to practice cutting uh, miters with the crown molding. But when you have, you have an outside corner, but when you have an inside corner, you need to get that profile to match. So for example, you have to get an inside corner to match just like that, all right? So how do you get this piece to come in and match this crazy uh, crown molding profile? Well, I'm gonna take you through that right now. So I have a couple pieces of crown molding. The first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna cut it on the chop saw. So you can see that I have a, an angle cut through the crown molding. Next, we're gonna talk about how we're gonna use the coping saw to cut along that profile. And that's what I'm gonna exactly demonstrate. So the first thing we have to do is understand that we have to cut up one angle. Then we come in and we're gonna cut a second angle or a second uh, track. Then we're gonna come up a third time and finally the fourth time. So there's four cuts, one, two, three, and four. And we're gonna do that. So we're gonna, lay out and we're going to trace the very edge so right where the wood meets the white that's what i want to cut right to so i'm going to use a coping saw to cut right to this penciled line again i'm going to do one two three and four cuts so Gonna leave the line. That's the first cut. You can see how I'm trying to go right to that crisp white edge. Not into it, not over the line, but split the line. Here's cut number two. I'm gonna move my set of cuts, just a fraction. So when you're cutting a coat with using a coping saw, using a blade that has 15 or 18 teeth per inch, tiny little teeth, and you're not gonna try to force the blade you're just gonna go keep the saw moving and you're gonna go back and forth, letting the teeth, the fine little teeth do all the work. And I'm gonna track right along that pencil line, right down my po profile. Now, because I have a mask, normally I'd be blown off that sawdust, but not now. I'm tracking right along that profile that I trace with my pencil. Being relaxed, back cutting it. Now that's one, two, I have a third cut here. I want to stay right off my line. Now I'm going to cut straight across here. That's a little trick. You have to actually if you think about that corner coming out. That corner 
going to meet the other molding. This one's coming into it, and I can push it right there, and I can make it fit in the corner. Now, if there's any gap, it's because every little piece of, uh, any piece of wood sticking out will prevent it from fitting perfectly tight. So we can dial that in with sharp chisels. We can take a little bit off and we'll, we'll teach you how to sharpen a chisel so that you can take off the smallest little bit of wood, right? Just like in other programs, sharpening is a big deal at North Bennett because as I say, it's more fun when it's sharp. If you don't have sharp tools or a sharp wit or a sharp mind, you're not gonna enjoy it as much as, as you would normally. So you can keep fitting it and dialing it in until you get the perfect fit. That's one way of coping, with a coping saw, chop saw, and by hand. We're gonna walk through the shop space and we're gonna show you two other ways of coping. Awesome. That's I great. Love that. That's the in the weeds version of coping. Yes. The manual version, I love that. That's the old school, everybody for hundreds of years were with using a little coping saw. Yeah. So why don't we walk into the shop space and follow Brock? Okay. Hey Brock. Hey everybody. Welcome to the main space in the carpentry department. This is the bench room or bench side of our department where all the students have space down either wall to put their tools, their uh, pack out tool holders. Uh, and all the gear they need on a weekly basis while they're here at school, as well as our front presentation space for the instructors. We put all of our important notes on the board, keep some of our tools up here uh, to give demonstrations for all the students, especially using our new technology, the TVs that you'll see here in the bench room and in the machine shop. We're going to walk all the way down and then head into our machine shop and take a peek at uh, a newer style of coping. Uh, trying to get to the same results that Peter showed you with handsaw uh, using some of the modern machinery that we have uh, at our disposal. Come on. Before we move, can you just tell us what you're, you're teaching right here? Sure. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so the students right now are getting their first uh, taste of framing, uh, drywalling, and trim work. Uh, because of the Sloyd style of method, uh, method of teaching that we use at North Bennett Street, the idea is that we try and get students to dip their toe into something new and then step back and reiterate those skills and build on them and then go deeper into that learning process with another big step into the pond later on. So our big piece of our learning here at school is something we call Bennett Town, where the students build a pod fully framed and finished on the interior uh, with hardwood flooring, paint, trim work, windows and doors. But to get into that project later on, they need to first get a clean understanding of framing, uh, and how framing dictates what happens with your trim work and your drywalling and the rest of your build. So these little mini walls, as we're calling them, is a good chance for students to learn basic layout of framing, hanging and cutting drywall, and then dialing in miters and coping for the trim work. They're installing base. There's going to be a small base cap that goes on top of this and then a piece of chair rail. You can see a piece of chair rail has already been started inside by one of the students. Mm -hmm. So it's a miniature living room. Just a, a just a little, little mini living room for the students to work on. And then we'll take these down and get right into building Bennett Town on a larger scale. That'll be a full size mock-up and there are six of them will fit in here. Three down this side and three on the other side for the students to build. That's cool when they put that up. It fills the entire length of this room. Yep. Size. Awesome. And it, like I said, it'll be fully finished. So the students will get work in a second round of framing, drywall with mud and taping on top of the drywall this time. So it'll be a full process of drywall, uh, wood flooring, trim, including baseboard, base cap, chair rail, and window and door casings, 
installation of windows and pre-hung doors, uh, trimming out a, an open doorway, as well as we'll get into a little bit of exterior work on some clapboarding, uh, exterior sheathing, uh, water resistive barriers, and a little discussion on building science and, and what we're looking for in our control layers of a building, water and air movement with insulation. Okay. That's great. Hey, if you're just joining us at home, uh, we're in the carpentry program at North Dennis Street School. It's a nine month uh, program and uh, the students are all here. Anybody have friends or family that are watching live here? You want to say hello? Hello. Hey. All right. I should have brought coffee for everybody. <laughs> all right, cool. So I'm going to the machine room. Yeah, we're going to head right down here to the machine room. How are you? So an integral part of modern carpentry is the use of modern machinery, whether it's hand machine tools or cabinet tools uh, in, a, in a large machine shop like this. So luckily uh, with at, Fort, at North Bennett Street, we are fortunate enough to have really amazing machine shops for our students to utilize. In this shop, you'll see a variety of different tools planers, joiners, band saws, table saws, of course, uh, and some more specialized tools like chisel mortisers um, that our students use throughout the year on a variety of projects, whether it's a simple set of saw horses they're building all the way through Bennett Town and finished cabinet work. <laughs> so when we, when we exit the department, we'll take time to look at the cherry cabinets that represent some of the cabinet work you'll do. Because the point of this program is to teach you residential building, to be able to understand and construct a, a, like a red, small one family dwelling. So we cover a lot of ground in the nine months. And um, we're all, we're all, we all love carpentry and we all want to learn it and master it. So like I said, I'm going to show you uh, another method for coping. Peter showed you coping with a handsaw, a coping saw. Uh, which is a fantastic method, incredibly accurate, still very much relied upon in the trades. But if you have access to some other tools, there are ways uh, that you can cope with something other than a coping saw. Uh, I'm gonna show you two methods. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to cope with a grinder and with a table saw. Now these are both uh, a little more specialized styles of coping and, and they certainly increase the safety factor when you're working with tools like this. You have to be important, you have to really think about the importance of safety, wearing eye protection, making sure you're safe, making sure you set the blade to a proper height, uh, making sure that your hands are free of any cutting tool uh, or spinning tool that they could hurt you. We certainly progress into this with the students after mastering coping saw by hand then as the students have built up their confidence with something like a table saw, then we can introduce something like uh, coping with table saw. So on this piece here, I've gone ahead and removed a bunch of the material. It's a little bit slow to start out with removing the large meat of the uh, piece of uh, trim that I've got here. So I wanted to speed up the process by removing some of it. Unfortunately, I'm gonna use a table saw, so it's gonna be a little loud. I'm going to move as quickly as I can through this and just show you some of the nuance of using a table saw to cope uh, moldings.
Nice work. As you can see, it's a, a can be a pretty quick method for removing a lot of material. Getting myself uh, a, a really nice rough poke. This would absolutely still need to be tuned up with a set of files. As you can see, I laid my files out on the outfeed table of the table saw. I would take this piece and then bring it around to the end of the outfeed table and start my work with a set of files, often a round and a triangle or, or some of my favorite files to work with, um, and get something cleaned up that would look a little more like that. And would have. Oh. A nice snug fit. Mm -hmm. After you use the coping saw, if you do the manual version of this, do you still have to clean up with the files? I do. Uh, I still prefer to clean up any of my work uh, with a set of files. Uh, that's how I was taught, and it's just a method I've stuck with. Like uh, many things in carpentry, there are a lot of ways to do it. There are a lot of ways to work on a, on a piece of molding, whether it's coped or mitered. Uh, everyone has their own kind of way they like to finesse the finish uh, on a piece of molding, and, and I tend to stick with files uh, as my finish result. Um, I'm going to show you one more method. We'll come around to this side of my outfeed table. I'll switch spots with you. Thanks, Brock. And I'm going to take this piece of molding, same molding, same profile. Again, I've removed a bunch of it, and now I'm going to remove uh, as much as I can with a grinder. This is a, a simple angle grinder with two 50 grit discs back to back on the tool. Uh, again, just like with the table saw, it's incredibly important to work safely, uh, to work within your limits, to know where your skill set is, uh, and be careful. Uh, I don't have a guard on this. Uh, I need to remove the guard to be as flexible as I can when I'm working with it, which means I need to be very clear about where my hands are and keeping them away from the spinning discs or the blade on the table saw when I'm working. Brock, before you begin, can we just make sure that our audience knows that this is not something that you try at home? This is absolutely not something you try at home. Uh, this is something that we don't even have the students try until they are incredibly comfortable and can work very safely with a table saw, with a coping saw first, understand the skill set required and the result they're looking for before they ever attempt something like this. This is something you should only handle if you are incredibly comfortable with these tools and can work in a safe environment. Uh, our saws are maintained uh, to be incredibly safe. Our blades are nice and sharp. We're making sure that we are as safe as possible when working in our machine shop and doing something as de detailed and intricate as coping with a table saw. As you can see, each different method has their own limitations based on the tooling that you're using. With a grinder, I can remove material very quickly, especially if I use a, a more aggressive set of discs. These are 50 grit. If I use a 24, I can remove material much quicker, especially in a pine molding like this. But at the same time, because of the disc spinning rotation and the, the way they're set up on the tool, it's tough for me to get into some of the smaller spaces that were more easily accessible with a table saw or certainly with a coping saw. 
So a couple more methods for you, showing some nice finished results based on how you're set up on your job site and the skills and space you have available to you. We've got a lot of options at our hands for coping materials uh, when we're trimming out a room. Thanks, Brock. Yeah, thank you. Do the students have any questions for Brock on that or myself on the coping? I see <laughs> one. Thanks, Joey. <laughs> Joey said no more questions. He's good. Oh, good. Somebody on the um, uh, on the chat here in our live audience asked if we if we taught some method of bisecting an angle. I don't know if I have the entire phrase right, but does does this? We would talk about uh, in, um, in terms of layout, finding laying out, then finding the angle. So bisecting the angle that way. Uh, that's what comes to mind when I hear that question. Um, so yes, drafting is definitely part of the component doing full scale layout so that you can find the angle and cut it in half so that, uh, you can make that nice cut. That's as, great, thank as, you. As well as using layout tools that we have at our disposal like protractors and, and uh, miter gauges from companies like Starrett that would allow us to get degrees that we can then take to a miter saw and start dialing in closer than what the tools even allow us to see. Cool, thank you. Where are we going next? We're gonna head out this way. We have a second half of the uh, shop space. So we call this the back nine. We can set up. Everybody, you notice how there's air hoses on the ceiling. So we have uh, pneumatic guns. We have obviously chop saws for all the student groups. We have uh, racks that handle all the different equipment and tools and lumber that we need. So this is the, what we call the back nine. We have a freight elevator that we can use to get the lumber up here take away the garbage, and then this is the panel saw room. So one of the nice tools that we have is a panel saw for cutting sheet wood, plywood. It'll cross cut and rip efficiently. We use that when we make cabinets. We have two groups set up in here for uh, the mini wall lesson. And uh, they're, they're gonna put the baseboard on today and get into the base cap today. And we'll see about tomorrow with the snowstorm coming. Will someone please tell me what this handle is every time I come in here. Yeah. <laughs> what is this? So this is nothing more than a simple tool for carrying large sheet goods. Like if this, if this was a whole uh, eight four feet, you can hook onto it easily, right? So it's for carrying sheet goods. Right? It's one of those simple things is just ingenious. Good yeah. gift for the holidays. <laughs> Stop and suffer. It's, it's, it's important to realize that as students are coming into the program, we all have our own backgrounds, our own skill sets, and our own um, limitations that we're trying to overcome. Some of them tend to be a physical limitation. If you're on the shorter side in terms of wingspan, it's tough to be able to pick up a four by eight sheet of material, which you're normally grabbing with your hand underneath, putting one hand on top and lifting it up to shoulder height. It's, that can be very difficult uh, for someone with a shorter wingspan. So using something as simple as that panel carrying tool, you can easily hook onto the bottom of it, shorten your wingspan and, and stand up comfortably with a panel and move it around the shop. When we force somebody or it, someone is forced to carry something that is beyond their wingspan or their carrying capacity, it puts them in a really dangerous position uh, for their back, for their shoulders and arms. And it's not safe for them to be doing that around the, the shop or in their career after they leave North Bennett Street. So we're hoping that while they're here, they're picking up really fantastic ways of working safely and comfortably around the site, moving heavy equipment and tools. Uh, Brock, uh, we have uh, another question from our live audience here. And uh, someone is asking, what's your favorite part of teaching? Oh, I've got to say my favorite part of teaching is absolutely the look on a student's face when they nail something perfectly, when they figure out uh, a miter angle and, and put two pieces of baseboard together and the miter is crisp and perfect and has just a, you know, very thin line at the joint that they can glue up and nail together and the look of satisfaction, personal satisfaction they get when they have absolutely just ace something like that uh, after struggling with it and, and, and figuring out the miter angle and getting it looking perfect that sense of satisfaction is absolutely what makes teaching 
uh, so valuable and so enjoyable for me. Cool. And and Peter, that's a tough answer to follow up, but I would love to hear from you also. It's, the students come in with all different skill sets background, but this is designed to take something that has very little background in woodworking and ramp them up. So I love the aha moments when something that was they wanted to understand and now you walk them through it and they get it and they can reproduce it, right? So that the aha moments where they know they like carpentry, but they just want to learn how to execute it. And then they grow in that, they can start doing it on their own and they go from very little skill to applying that skill and having confidence. So that growth in confidence. That's great. And I feel like all the programs at North Bennett Street School, you know, you mentioned the Floyd method uh, earlier, Brock, but the, all the curriculum delivery is meant to give you exposure, experience, build up your skill, build up your confidence and get you to a place where you're uh, able to go out and get employment in the field. So yeah. thanks for that. Can I ask the same question that they just asked the faculty of a few of the students? What is, whoever wants to speak, what's one of your favorite things you've learned? Granted, we're only halfway through your year. What's, a, what's one favorite thing you've learned? Uh, I mean, one thing to best learn that um, I guess I'm learning is, you know, how to use the tools properly and safely. Uh, but other than that is, you know, actually learning all the methods uh, to be able to use, like, you know, a minor saw, uh, you know, all the different degrees that are, you know, that are the components that go to it. Uh, just never having to use one like that before, it definitely helps and actually learning how to, you know, do woodwork in the right way. Cool. And you were playing baseball before you jumped in here. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nice. What else? I have something. Um, when I first started woodworking by myself and with my parents, um, the tolerances were different. It was, well, if it works, that's good enough. Here, you really learn to dial in your tolerance and you find that the more you work, the more, the tighter your tolerances get and the, your, the quality of your work grows by the time you start to finish, it's night and day difference. That's great. Anyone else? Cool. Celia, how about you? <laughs> Celia works at a hardware store. Hi, Charles Street Supply. Hi, Charles Street Supply. <laughs> What's your favorite tool? To work? How about something like your favorite tool to work with? I like the table saw. Yeah. The table saw is my favorite because it's like just so incredibly versatile. You can do so many things. I hadn't seen coping on a table saw before, but I thought that was really rad. Um, but just so many things you can do A to Z using that tool. Um, I'll also say, kind of piggybacking off of Matt. Um, I love that this space like teaches us to work at a really high caliber, but it's also like a comfortable space to do it. You know, like we're free to make mistakes. And I think that our teachers do a really awesome job at like starting us off at that base level because a lot of us come in here with not much with working skill and just bringing us up to speed. I think they do a really phenomenal job and I'm like so stoked to be here. That's nice. great. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, let's go out and look at the front hall and some of the cabinets that the previous boxes have done. Thank you. Brock, thank you. Yeah. So these are some of the cabinets uh, previous couple of years ago, the class made cherry cabinets. This class this year, we're going to make cabinets to uh, better organize the tools, something similar to this. Last year's class made uh, bathroom bannies that went to a job site. Uh, so we introduced a wide range of, uh, from drywall, cabinetry, we get into stair building, we tackle roof framing, uh, both gable roofs and hip roofs, uh, and we, we give you the shop space and the patience and the materials to make mistakes and learn. There's no one saying, oh, you got to meet this deadline. We encourage you to understand what you're doing, not just rush through it. A big part of this program is not to give you a skill to get a job, but to give you a career. We don't want you to have a job at the end of this. We want you to have a career. We talk a little bit about that. We go on, uh, we take tours of different contractors that we have relationships with. So this class got to see a great project uh, and a fantastic project. We've been to a sawmill where we walked through with the owner of the sawmill and saw logs being converted. They even got to go to a homeowner who let us set up a Woodmiser portable band saw mill and saw some logs just to get exposure to that. So really, we try to cover all the ground and there's a lot of ground to cover. So uh, having a great attitude, great worth ethic and the desire to learn, that's what we're looking for. Perfect. That's great.
Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, what uh, what time we have, do we have? We have a few minutes, and I wanted two things. If remember, yeah. remember the space in here? How we saw the north end out, out of the, this beautiful world. Oh yeah. Can we show? You want to do that? that? It's just. I want to show people where they can go for lunch? Yeah, it's just a, a really amazing. Some of the place. best sandwiches uh, on the on the east coast. So you're in this space of you know a building, and right outside is the north end. Yeah, and our loading dock is uh, right below this window here where all our materials can uh, come come in and out. Uh, and then we're back in that bench room here. The benches, if you can look around here at the toolkits and things like that, the benches were all built by students. When we moved in here around 2015, uh, the, the uh, program built out a lot of this stuff. So you can see the... Uh, uh, those benches and even the uh, wainscoting here, um, all done by students. And in every one of these programs, students get started and by like the second week, all of this stuff is already being made. So, so it's pretty fantastic. I also want to point out, if Rob already mentioned all of the toolkits here, this is another one of the programs, um, one of the shorter programs where we outfit the students with a full toolkit day one so that they're all starting at the same starting line. And um, part of, and I don't know if you want to speak yeah. to this, but um, Peter and Brock are both graduates of the Preservation Carpentry Program, and they use a lot of that knowledge in their toolkits here and outfitting their toolkits. And, and before that, I'll just add that Kristen is the person who puts every single one of these toolkits together. Thank you, Kristen. So <laughs> Kristen works really hard because there's uh, 18, 20, 24 toolkits to put together. But you come in, we have a Christmas in September, right? We're unpacking your tools, you're labeling your tools, you're ramped up on that. Now we're going to teach you how to use those tools safely and effectively and in a professional pro way. Uh, you want to add anything to that, Brock? Kristen has worked really hard with Peter and I to curate a toolkit that is really high quality. Uh, there are a lot of options out there for buying anything in your toolkit, whether it's chisels or nail sets or anything, any of the small little miscellaneous items that we require you to bring with you. But the toolkit that we've created here at school is really detailed, really high end, and puts students on a fantastic footing to start day one. It allows them to know that we're not dealing with um, manufacturer issues when they get out their circular saws or working with their driller driver kit. We know that the motors, the, the grips, the bits they're using, every part of every device or tool they're using with us is prorated, is high quality, and we can depend on them for the rest of the student's career. We're not choosing tools that are just good for the nine months where you're, where you're here. The toolkit, the tools that are coming in that toolkit are the same tools that I use every day on a job site. Uh, they are uh, really well put together these kits for students. When they roll right in, you can open them up and get right to work. Marcus has the tool belt on. So Marcus Santa here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Give us a spin. Oxidal, yeah. Oxidal tool belt. You're ready to go. Uh, nice. Yeah, Marcus, you're loaded up. And that tool belt will be with them for 20, 30 years. Yeah, and uh, there was a question from our audience just about the cost of tools. I want to say the cost of tools is somewhere right around two grand. Two grand, yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, these tools are something that it's an investment uh, like everything. And uh, you'll bring these with you when you leave here. Uh, and uh, like Peter said, you'll have them for uh, some of these for 20 years uh, plus. Um, we also, I wanted to ask uh, because... Every once in a while, the programs will uh, will switch, and I know that you have a partnership with cabinet and furniture making. Um, and uh, will you just talk about that for a little bit? Sure. So, at times we can cross pollinate, if you will. We can uh, work with cabinet and furniture to do like wood turning, or to even like these cabinets here were built, but with the help of an instructor from cabinet and furniture making, um, you'll also be exposed to. We have several students last year that are now in cabinet and furniture making. So if you like carpentry and you want to keep going with it, it doesn't mean you have to stop at nine months. You can keep going with it. So there is in a normal non-COVID year, uh, sort of cross-pollination between programs. So preservation carpentry, which uh, Brock and I both went through. I'm a 2004 graduate. 
Brock, when he, you can explain how uh, Ben Town or timber framing was done that way. Yep. So part of that cross pollination, as Peter called it, uh, when I was a student, my class from preservation came up here and we learned how to stick frame, how to hang windows and doors, a lot of interior trim and drywall with the carpentry instructors while the carpentry students were downstairs learning how to timber frame with the preservation students or preservation instructors. So we do a lot of that back and forth as much as we can to allow students to have a, a broader understanding of carpentry, not just the modern or preservation or cabinet and furniture fields, but a bit of experience all the way across the board. Uh, as well as cross pollinating with other departments, you have what Peter talked about, students who have graduated from one program matriculating into another program and bringing that experience with them. This year in Carpentry, we have two students who came down from upstairs from the cabinet and furniture program. And so they're bringing with them those experiences of working in a, in a highly hand tool oriented uh, furniture based environment. And so they're bringing that experience to trim work and framing here uh, in the Carpentry department. And their classmates are, are seeing some of that uh, learning that they got upstairs and, and how that translates to our world down here in, in modern carpentry. That's great. And the, the carpentry program here is, uh, as we've mentioned, it's a nine month uh, program. Uh, it is Monday through Thursday, and the focus is on modern residential stick frame and finish work, about 50-50. Uh, there's a lot of work that happens in the space that we're in, and then there's a lot of field work uh, that happens as well. And you know, we get a lot of questions about the differences between especially the three programs that have been mentioned, cabinet and furniture making, preservation carpentry, uh, and carpentry. One of the things that I'll share sometimes is that uh, in this program, I believe you'll uh, learn to install doors and windows that many times might be prefabricated. And in the preservation carpentry program, you'll build those doors and windows from scratch and then install them. Uh, the easy way to compare this is this is nine months, that's 18 months. Uh, but, but as Brock and Peter have both mentioned, there's a lot of crossover with the skill, the education, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of crossover with employment. Uh, we have uh, graduates from both programs that are, that are many times working for um, uh, similar employers. I think one of the aspects that's unique about the carpentry department is also in, in comparison to preservation or cabinet and furniture is the fact that the field we're sending our students into after they graduate is an ever-changing world of materials, code compliance, energy uh, ratings, all of that is constantly changing. And so our curriculum is constantly updating to allow our students to leave here with as broad an understanding of building science, uh, how to insulate properly, how to protect from uh, water intrusion into a building, all of these different, and, and how to work with engineered materials that are becoming more and more prevalent on job sites from uh, laminated veneer lumber to um, wood eye joists and uh, occasionally the introduction of seal stud work uh, that is required in some of our residential buildings these days. And I'll just point out that this is an industry, this is a field that does not require formal training. So a lot of the people that are in the construction field will start out as a laborer and work their way up if they can. So I'd say the 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 return on investment in thinking about formal training is back to this concept of getting exposure, getting experience, building your skill, and then being employable. And you know, you might come in here thinking, I love framing, I just want to frame, frame, frame. And then you get exposed to cabinet building and you get excited about that. And then a job opportunity gets connected with that. So it's it's pretty cool trying to give graduates as many tools in their tool belt as possible when they leave here. Not just framing, not just cabinet work, not just trim work, but all of those together. Making a, a student, a graduate, as well-rounded as possible so that when they leave here, they can jump right into any residential crew and immediately start helping, help start working, start assisting the carpenters that were already on staff and jumping right in and not having to start out as a uh, laborer, but being able to jump right up to assisting with framing and trim work uh, on a residential project. Let's take a look at some of the uh, off-site work that we've done through the pictures that are on the wall. Oh, that's great. So if we come down here, 
we can just, we have some pictures, right? You can see stair building in, in the shop space we have. We introduce you to this uh, and we'll trim the whole stair out. Uh, sometimes, at different times, we're doing like uh, shed building. This year's, this year's class is gonna build a garage and uh, reproduce a 1920s stick frame garage on Quincy. That's a 12 by 20 garage with a hip roof. Timber framing, Brock and I both love timber framing. I spent uh, basically 18 years timber framing working with uh, Jack Sobin, the architect, and for David Lanou, who's a timber framing outfit, fine home builder. But this gives you a flavor, right? We're talking finished interiors, we're talking stick framing, timber framing, we're talking foundation up, right? We're looking at being able to produce a house that starts with a foundation uh, or an addition. So you can, you, we cover a lot of ground and, um, What's also nice, if you want to talk about the difference between PC and carpentry, preservation carpentry is interested in 18th and 19th century tools and techniques. So how does the hand plane work with the, or how does the, the fro work in timber framing? We're interested in the power skill saw, the pneumatic nailer. We're not interested in how to use a wooden hand plane, right? But we do teach you block plane and a modern number four plane. So we get you, uh, we do do dives into sharpening, hand planes, but not to reproduce 18th century interior finishes. We're using jointers, Williams and Hussey's modern tools to do that. Um, so uh, we, we definitely have a robust program that's interested in teaching you a, a, a career, not just a job. Um, we had just had a student earlier this week on Zoom, who is a graduate last year, trying to get people to come to his company as interns. One of the nice things about this program is Fridays are off. So you can take a job Friday, Saturday, or just Friday. A lot of students take advantage of that. It's a great way to jump in with a company because if you think about it, you're, you're, they get to try you out, you get to try them out. If it doesn't work, you can go onto our job board and you can keep going through the different options that are out there. Um, so one of the biggest advantages of North Bend is also it's a networking uh, muscle. Really, that's, that's an important feature of North Bennett. So uh, we have a great alumni association. We have great alumni that are building amazing buildings throughout Boston and, in fact, uh, North America. We have a great job board where jobs are being posted. Uh, they come in every day just about. And so that's another strong attribute of North Bennett. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. And uh, are there any questions from our live audience here? I know I saw one earlier that was about do the toolkits uh, stay here? And the answer is yes, unless people need to bring them home for the jobs on Friday, Saturday, as Peter mentioned. Uh, and then when we go out to a job site, uh, the school has a van to transport all of the tools and the toolkits uh, for the students. Uh, we, we help transport tools, especially for students that don't have their own mode of transportation in terms of a vehicle. Uh, we'll help transport some of their toolkits out to the job site. Uh, but the students leave their, their gear here during, during the week, especially when we're going to be in the building uh, for an extended period of time. Their tools all stay here, uh, safely stored up in our department. And then when we roll out to a job site, we'll have a big loadout day where everything goes out to a job site. So we take that day to move everyone's, not just the students' equipment, but we'll have to move the department's table saws and chop saws and other equipment that we'll need for that job site. Kim, you also, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you work off site, not all students have a vehicle. So you do really great at creating a carpool system within your students, right? We, we do, yes. We, we work, uh, one of the first things we have to figure out at the beginning of the year is uh, making sure everyone has figured out who they're gonna be with uh, when they need to get to a job site. Our job sites may be as much as 40 minutes, 45 minutes away from the building here in the North End. And so we have to be very clear as to how people are transporting, not only themselves, but their equipment to and from job sites on a daily basis when we're out in the field. And so we often have students who need to figure out a buddy system, a carpool system to jump in with each other and, and move out to the job site. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it works out. It does. It works great. Yeah, uh, yeah we, we uh, have not had any, any issues uh, aside from the usual 
problems of traffic or, or transport, public transportation, uh, so certainly during the winter, mm -hmm. uh, during storms. Great. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then we, uh, we are in a, a pods for safety. And um, uh, I know we talked about that earlier about uh, how all the students are. And if you guys could just share with us a little bit about, um, I know there's been a lot of preparation, a lot of thought that's gone into this uh, in order to bring back the students that were returning and needed to finish out uh, and all the new students that we uh, see here. That's a great point. So it really boils down to that you cannot teach experience, right? No one's going to go to the open heart surgeon who's only ever studied a textbook. They want somebody that's got years of experience doing it. So what we've done is create a safe environment, even with COVID, right? So we have a daily screening that I'm sure Rob's talked about. We have uh, everyone's wearing masks. We all have been tested multiple times in this program to make sure that we're COVID free. We have a robust program online. Right. Even though we, we expect you to have hands on component, there's also uh, academic learning that can happen online. So, for example, these students are going to go on Christmas break here and then they're going to come back and online they're going to take OSHA 10, which is a safety program through the federal government. They're going to get CAD drawn. That's another thing we do in North uh, Carpenter Department. We have an online CAD. Uh, think about a computerized drawing of, of architecture. So they're gonna be doing 16 hours of that, the first week of January, 10 hours of OSHA training. We post, uh, Brock's really good about posting like YouTube videos and other podcasts that we listen to. So they have a Google Classroom as a place to collect and disseminate information that we expect each student to listen to and respond to. Uh, so that's we, a start. I understand that there's a world of information out there beyond the walls of North Bennett Street. The goal of being here is to get the hands-on experience, to get your hands on the tools and the materials and really learn the in-depth uh, feel that is involved in all of the different processes we go through uh, in whether it's doing trim work or timber framing or framing up a wall. But there is a massive amount of information outside of these walls. And so we've started bringing more and more of that information in, bringing guest lecturers through Zoom uh, posting articles and uh, social media pages and YouTube videos that are that are really enhancing the learning experience for our students while they're here in the building. We're just this week going to start Thursday morning uh, discussions. We're going to meet as a class for an hour on Thursday mornings and talk about what we've all been seeing online on social media, articles we've been reading uh, based on stuff that's being posted to our Google Classroom, as well as that students are going out on their own and, and finding, whether it's a podcast about building science or uh, a, an Instagram page on trim carpentry, something they're seeing, a technique or a topic they've never heard of that they want to know more about, and we're going to have a discussion about those on Thursday mornings, uh, kind of a bringing the exterior learning possibilities into our building, into our classroom. We go to ABX, that's a big conference for architects and builders. We just attended that online. We have JLC, which is construction of uh, Journal of Light Construction. That's going to come up. Uh, hopefully, it'll happen. Right now, it's scheduled for August. But normally, every year, we go to that in Providence. So we, we get out in the field, both for hands-on experience and also exposure to other opportunities. That's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, uh, it just occurred to me, I, I want to go back to the students and I want to ask them if they have any advice uh, for anyone who is thinking of coming to North Bennett Street School. Uh, it's always a good one uh, for us as we um, work with and find people. Hey, everybody, if I could just ask you, it just occurred to me uh, because, you know, we've all worked together in admissions for you to come here, but uh, does anybody have any thoughts or advice for anyone else? Uh, who might be thinking of coming here, um, you know, something maybe you didn't know or didn't think of, and now that you're at this vantage point, uh, it would be good advice for people. Do it. Yeah. Yeah, um, do a little project before you end, so that way, by the time you're done, you can look back on what you did and kind of reflect what you would have done differently. I built a shed before I came here. And now looking back, just now a couple of weeks into the program, I'm looking back thinking, oh, I could have done this differently. And if I did it this way, it would have been so much better. I think that helps a lot. Cool. So getting a little bit of experience, whether or yeah. not you're ripping off somebody's deck or just jumping in on a, 
on a project. Literally anything. Cool. Anybody else? Any thoughts? So, for this is for veterans who might be wanting to come to the school, which I highly recommend. The GI Bill does cover it. The school is great with veterans. Um, but for the carpentry program, and I know for sure the cabinet and furniture program upstairs, um, you have 36 months on your post 9 11. However, with the work hours that we go through with at least these two courses for sure it counts as 12 months yeah so just so you're aware the work hours take off 12 months of your gi bill benefits amanda that's a great point and that's something that uh myself and jamie dergay will talk with uh with veterans who are thinking to come here the concept is called the rate of pursuit and the way that the VA calculates the months uh, towards training through the 9-11 uh, is, is geared towards an academic calendar. So when they talk about you have 36 months as a full boat or 12, uh, um, when we have nine months, our nine months essentially translate to 12 months of those VA benefits. And it's exactly as Amanda said, it's all about uh, the clock hours. You know, if you go to an academic setting and you're taking uh, credits, those credit, you might be in class for 15 hours total, uh, taking five classes a week. Here, this is essentially like uh, the same commitment as a full-time job, 35 hours plus. And so that's how the VA calculates a rate of pursuit. Thank you for that point, Amanda. And thanks everybody here. Um, I just want to give everybody one more shot to say hello to our live audience, friends and family. Uh, I was going to say something. Oh, what do you got, Simara? So, um, before I came to this program, I was a recruiter, and so I was working a full-time job. And so in terms of thinking about the cost of coming here, um, you get a lot of support from the admissions office as well as the finance um, department. But there are ways of getting your school financed. So there are scholarships. So I'm a recipient of the Workforce Development Scholarship here, but I'm also a recipient of the uh, Mike Rose uh, Foundation Scholarship. So there are multiple ways of getting funded to make this a reality. So if you do want this to be a part of your reality, it is possible. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Siamara. And Siamara comes with us uh, from Youth Build Boston. Uh, one of our partners and your intention is to go back there and to uh, transition from a recruiter to a, a instructor. Yes, sir. That's great. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you. Cool. Brock, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are on our way to violin making and repair. Uh, and that's right next door. Uh, so interestingly enough, um, the one of our shortest programs, Carpentry, which is nine months, uh, is right next to our longest program, uh, which is 30 months. Um, the other two uh, things to think about between these two is Carpentry is serving one of the very largest uh, uh, industries that has a high need uh, for skilled workers and violin making uh, is probably out of all the things that we teach here, one of the smallest uh, industries as well. So we usually have about 26 students uh, in carpentry every year for the nine months uh, and we'll start all 26 of them uh, uh, every fall, every September. And then for, uh, for violin making, we start about two to four people uh, every six months or so, every spring in February. And we've got a maximum uh, number of students there of uh, 12 all together. Uh, so we're gonna walk in there now. And then, oh yeah, I have my safety glasses on, safety. Like, I can keep them on. Oh, Nick needs them back actually. Does he? Yeah, his. I'll give them back then. <laughs>
All right, and then I'm gonna just, sorry, I'm trying to flip my camera here to my co-host, Kristen. Hi, everyone. And, and Kristen, you are also at noon. Why don't you uh, oh, tell yeah, our home so audience noon, what you're gonna be up to? At noon, I'll be down in the store. Actually, yeah, at, you may take a You please. Um, at noon, I'll be back in the store, um, popping into various alumni studios. We're going to see Melly Finelli, a jeweler. Um, Mitch Gundrum is giving a tool demo in the store. Martha Kearsley a print demo and Zalo Yang is going to call us in from call us from Vancouver to talk about furniture making. Very cool. All right, so I'll, I'll call you in two seconds. Okay, great. Thanks for doing that. And then just to mention, um, you can use financial aid uh, from Canada by province uh, as well as uh, Canadian military benefits. Okay, so we are in violin making and repair. Uh, and when we did move into this new building, uh, Roman Varnas, who's the head of the program, uh, from what I recall, he had the pick of uh, choosing what room because the natural light uh, was, was really important. Of course, I say that and all the shades are down, but I'm sure there's a reason for it. Hi. How's it going? How are you? Pretty good. How are you guys? Good. good. So we're traveling around. We're bringing a live audience uh, with us. Uh, so people are uh, uh, logged in from like all over the world, yep. and uh, um, and we're here to share what happens in violin making and repair. Yeah. Um, who are we speaking with first? Uh, um, is anybody doing moves? Sure. Let's go so on. we can talk to you first. Sure. Why not? All right, what are you working on, Veronica? So I'm uh, working on a couple scrolls, actually. Um, so uh, I'm not at the most exciting part of the process, but right now I'm just sort of establishing the general outline, um, which I need to do before I can get to the actual carving. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's what I'm up for. Wow. Yeah, I've got a couple different... What is this? Is this a, a mo Oh, yeah. yeah, so this is a cast of a nice Stradivari scroll that we're lucky enough to have here for reference. Mm -hmm. um, very key to the whole process. I don't really need it so much for this step, but um, it's good to just have it available. Right. Yeah. Oh. Um, oh, you're going to show us varnishing. That was what I have down. Oh, I'm actually all done, but I can show you what I just finished varnishing. Okay. Um, so this is my first instrument that just got strung up a few weeks ago. Can you tell us, well, me and, yeah. our, uh, and our audience here, um, how many layers of varnish go <laughs> into this? Well, <laughs> on this particular instrument, um, over the, the shutdown, I kind of ran into some varnish issues, what? which greatly increased the number of coats that went into this instrument. So I completely lost count. It's over a hundred for sure. Um, but are you serious? Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. This um, type of varnish, spirit varnishing, um, always requires many more coats than oil varnish. Um, usually, like closer to the more like fifty range. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I had to chase down some um, crackle issues that came up. Oh, um, because you because you had to leave it. Well, I I took it home with me, but mm -hmm. it's not the most. Um, climate controlled environment and definitely I was trying to regulate the humidity as much as I could and some of it also just had to do with I think the particular concoction of varnish we made was a little more prone to crackling so yeah. some combination of all those things yeah um I mean it looks beautiful yeah <laughs> thank you yeah, yeah thanks. it's really gorgeous finish yeah. thanks we just have a question pop up about if you could just repeat the type of varnish uh that you that you use yeah here. so this is um an alcohol-based varnish okay um, yeah, with um, I use uh, sandalwood pigment for the coloring, and then the clear coats on top are a mix of sand rack and shellac. Oh. Cool. Wow. Thank you. Um, yeah, no hey, Roman, how are you? Very good. How are you? Great. What's happening? Well, we just do the same as usual. You try to make some violins. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Have a little fun with it, too. Not too much, not too little. And then. Uh, we have a very good group of people, very focused, and it shows good work so far. Excellent. So we're enjoying every day. Great. Are we cool. going to see some rib um, rib bending? We'll see how this goes. We have a sure. couple of projects ready. One of them 
uh, elder. Well, going starting here is Daniel. Daniel is uh, going to assemble his violin soon. Before we can actually start we're putting it together, we have to make sure the alignments are correct, everything is good. So we may not be able to see it right at this moment, but he's pretty much one step before gluing the back on and we're just making sure things are aligned correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, after all work, sometimes things move a little bit. So we just want to reposition it and make sure that we can go right back where it belongs. And then going down, uh, it's Ada. She's uh, graduating her plate and Elliot is doing outline. And that's also just a part of it. I love walking in on this process because I you always end up seeing tons of clamps around this instrument. How many end up going around the instrument? Well, we will have a clamps going all around the ribs. So there's around uh, among, I mean, we about 20 of those clamps. 20, yeah, yeah. But uh, it sometimes depends, something we don't need as many to fill every little spot. But it's nice to put even pressure. So most of the time, mm -hmm. it's just such a clunky tool for such a delicate object. Well, in some way, but if we look at their shape, it's a really smart shape. So there's a little pressure point here, which press, presses onto the, onto the perflane. This way we don't damage the edge. So it's a really smart design for mm -hmm. this particular job. It's only we use it for the gluing the plates onto the bridge. But the little groove here clears the edge. And then there's another little step that holds. Uh, so, so it's like a barrier. We don't go too far into the uh, violin. So we don't risk damaging or pressing too far past the perfume. Now this, uh, this distance for that screw is also good. So it allows us for cleaning between, if we look here, there's a space between that uh, screw and then clamp. So it's a it's, it's very smart design just for that type particular job, but having it, it, it makes everything much easier. And the, the color codes here, is that about a different length or tension or something like for that? For different parts of the violin. So the blue are for the external external oh, curves. The curves within yeah. the, the, the yes. mold there. Oh, yes. This one a little more relaxed. It's for the C bow. And this one will be for the corner bow. So cor corners. I see. So it has a more curve. And these ones are for the outside bow. So they have a different direction. Convex versus concave. So each of them have their own spots. Yes. And the color is good because if, if I grab the clamp, I don't have to search for the right versus this. I write it Sure. Um, while we're standing here, Daniel, if you don't mind, can I touch these plates? Yeah, go right One ahead. of everybody's favorite things to see are the scales of the planes that violin makers use from that to this tiny little guy. I mean, Thank you. That just melts everyone's hearts. <laughs> yeah, so we use them for different. Oh, this is the violin maker's plane. Yes, right? for different jobs. We use black planes. We we like to have uh, like to think that the size of the plane will create different uh, challenges. And for example, very small plane will uh, enter into into tight places. So these little planes, we use them for C bouts around the plates. And then the larger plane is good for longer, making sure that surface can be straight and longer in longer distances. And we try usually use larger plane more so we don't make small divots. And then when the largest plane doesn't access, we start going smaller. Mm -hmm. That's great. So Roman, we've got we've got a, a little more than forty five minutes to spend with you uh, before we turn it over to Kristen, who's going to be. Uh, talking with alumni that are all in different places. Um, you know, I feel like each one of these full-time programs, uh, it's its own industry. There's so many different, uh, so many different things. Um, will you, one thing that comes to my mind is sharpening. And I feel like this program approaches sharpening uh, in, in such a specific way. So many different, um, you know, grits uh, to sand with. Uh, will you, uh, share with us uh, a little bit about um, sharpening here and then show us uh, this the station over here. Yes, of course. That's our sharpening station. And, uh, it's a good place to start because it's yeah. right in the beginning of the curriculum, yeah. right? Yeah, we start with sharpening because if we don't have sharp tools, we can have nice idea about how we like to cut or shape the wood, but without uh, that properly working tool, it's very difficult 
or, or in, in, in possible maybe. So basically we start with very fundamental um, process of sharpening. And we start with chisels because, or, or plain blades because they're slightly more straightforward. And then we move to more, more complex uh, uh, such as uh, edges such as curved knives or maybe gouges or at the end scrape. If we have, uh, we spend sometimes about a month on setting up all the tools that are necessary. But at the end of this, uh, most of the time is two weeks, but at the end of that process, students will have sharp tools and then they're ready to, to move when, on. To when you work. say set up the tools, you're saying sharpen them, right? Them yes, but use. we also change the edge angle. So it's like the tool comes from the, from the manufacturers are mostly concerned with the type of steel. The steel has to be very good. And then the shape of it has to be close to what we want to have, but we do reshape them. So we use a grinder here, the one or, you know, there's few, two more of them that we have in the program. It is a, it is a grinder that will help us. It's removable on purpose, <laughs> but basically it's a grinder that will help us get the rough shape of the tool. And uh, if we need to change the angle, maybe we'll do the faster job. And then from there, we move on to the handstand and handstand will basically bring the edge to the sharpest level. And our highest grid is 30,000 stone, which is very fine. This will usually assure extremely sharp edge. We like to split hair sometimes with sharp edge, but the point is it's um, just to be able to execute the form that we have in mind. So for example, when we're cutting sound holes in the instrument and uh, they're made in the spruce, spruce is a type of material that has a soft component, which is the, uh, the soft grain of the, sp the spruce and the hard component, which is the hard grain. And now cutting through this with one, one blade, the blade has to be super sharp to cut through the, so the soft grain without tearing it, and then very durable to cut through the hard grain <laughs> so mm -hmm. it can make it through. And that combination uh, requires the best steel and best sharp, uh, sharpening together. Once we have that tool, we can feel better about uh, executing our shapes and, and not having too much trouble with them. So very crucial component mm -hmm. of the problem. Oh, that's great. And then this, um, the, the whole setup here, uh, the size of this is uh, really to accommodate uh, a, a large group so that everyone yes. uh, can keep keep the pace. Um, yes, uh, with without, without the distancing, we could have uh, six uh, students sharpen and the instructors playing the band over there and looking at it, or maybe also sharpen along the, along the group. With, uh, with today's need for a little more space, we usually have two or three people maximum at this. Still large enough that we can, with, with on the upper corners, we, we can put two people to do good work or one person. And the table is made just for us and it's a steel structure with the lab uh, type of top, counter, counter top material, which is resistant for, for uh, chemicals. We don't need that type of resistance for chemical, but we really use waterproof. Uh, yeah qualities of it and also durability. So we really enjoy having this. The sink is important because very often we have to lubricate our surfaces with water, which means it's just easy to access so we don't have to go get water and come back next. Everything's cleaner, faster, more enjoyable to work. Mm -hmm. And never in biomaking do you use any oil stone? We, we have oil stone. Uh, we use a little bit less of it. It's, uh, it's I don't think it's necessarily uh, such a such a thing. What we use, as long as we have a sharp edge. Mm -hmm. uh, why I like I like this water stone system because our thirty thousand stone maybe may right. it goes. It is so, such a fine stone that I am able to make super sharp, and it's difficult to find oil stone at that height. Mm -hmm. But uh, both have their good things, and we just go for for water for mainly because the type of stone that we use uh, suit our work better and. And works for us excellent but uh, i use my past also with the oil stone so i, I like them both mm -hmm. for different mm -hmm. things and this is the shaft and stone that we yeah there's a shaft and nano pond. we have two basically manufacturers we have other things too but mainly it's a shaft uh, and they're very similar in some aspects the both water stones and uh, for for example flat edges i use 
one five percent more than for curved edges such as gouges. Um, what happens with the nanohorn here? They have a two hundred grit stone, so if we need some quick removal of, of steels, it works pretty well. And uh, and uh, if we need super polished edge, we use thirty thousand. So so again, it kind of comes to us: what do we need to have done, and we reach for the correct tool that will fit us mm -hmm. or give us the best results. Something that I learned from you and that probably not many people understand is that when you sharpen the glass stone, it, it creates an unevenness on the stone. And yeah. so then you use this to flatten the stone yes, again. That's correct. that's correct. I think that's fascinating. That's correct. Yes, because the stone will wear out. So if I use particular stone and then tool is any shape, can be knife, can be plain. If I keep rubbing that, eventually stone will wear out and the surface will be not so flat. And then it's difficult to get consistent results from stone to stone. So it helps great people have a very good flattening system for mm -hmm. it. And uh, in the old times, we would just rub one stone against the other and it gave us something. It was not so bad. Two days we have these excellent, super precise flattening diamond stones that will definitely help. So them. this is a newer technology, is that yes. what you're saying? Yes, it's newer. The diamond stones are not super no, we sharpen tools, not we, but the, the people sharpen tools for hundreds of years. Diamond stones are more of a, our modern time mm -hmm. type of thing. And and why is the it diamond? It's a it's a nickel plate or some sort of alloy metal plate in from 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 one manufacturer to another. It can vary, but basically there is a diamond dust sprinkle onto it, and then uh, the process of manufacturing has to be accurate so we can have a very flat surface. That surface will now transfer and make this surface flat. And once I have a stone flat, I can reliably uh, sharpen my plates. And that mostly matters for plain blades and just something that has a flat back mm -hmm. of the blade or, or you know, there's a big component of the blade that's flat. For knives, we could potentially, especially with curved or, or gouges, we could not be so uh, demanded, demanding about the flatness, but still helps, but mostly crucial for plain blades. Thank you. Thank you for that. When we walked in here, I had mentioned, because we're here with a, a live audience, and if uh, if you're just joining us, or, or if you've been with us, uh, we're with Roman Barnes uh, and Kristen Odell. We're in the violin making and repair program, our longest program at 30 months of training. Uh, to share with everyone, the different lengths of training are all about what is the necessary amount of time to pick up the skill and confidence to go and be employed in the field? Uh, I mentioned when we walked in here that you got the first pick of rooms in, in the, all the buildings uh, because of the light. I don't know if it's a rumor and if there's other faculty listening to me, I don't think that there's any truth to that. Um, uh, and, and then I also feel like because the space, you got a real opportunity coming in this new space to design this like you wanted to the uh from what i understand the when new students come in they're at the far end of the room and and uh they kind of work them their way up closer to the varnish room uh where they'll be spending a lot more time uh, as they progress there's a total of seven instruments that are made in the program uh, your first violin is going to take you about nine months or so. Now there's, you know, we want people to learn uh, in their own time at their own speed so that they learn uh, how to do it correctly and confidently. Uh, and then after that, your production speed uh, picks up pretty significantly. Uh, and it's, uh, let me see, it's uh, six violins, a viola, an optional instrument, which may or may not be a cello, and never again a bass. <laughs> it's a, it's a, definitely, at least we joke that way about the basses. However, there were two basses, maybe there was more than two in the, during my time, there were two basses. Right. Before something like something. And it, it was a journey, it was a nice thing. We are better set up for making violins and cellos. So when somebody really likes uh, Base idea. It's a stepping outside slightly of our our setup. It makes perfect sense, and it's right in the title of the program. But, uh, however, it's uh, the basis is it's, it's, if somebody makes nice violins and cellos, it's not such a giant step. And there are certain um, certain technical aspects of the best bass that have to be definitely uh, maybe 
if someone yeah. wants to make a great base and they already make channels, they probably talk, should talk to great base maker to, to compare notes. But uh, with the skills that somebody can produce a good channel, they can adapt very quickly. Cool. Progressively shorter amount of time that you yes. are able to make an instrument by the end of your time in this program. What is, how long does it take to complete one instrument? Yeah, so first, first instrument takes so many months also because we sharpen for a long time. So right. we sharpen them with triple templates, we prepare a mold. So this, this whole, we basically tool up for the environment before we actually can start going and making this violin. So it takes longer. Then later when everybody's uh, made a couple of violins already, a few instruments, uh, they will have their templates and they'll have their tools fairly well maintained. So the process short, shortens. They also, the students will understand uh, the process better so they can uh, work with their timing better. They don't have to wait for instruction necessarily. They can move for the next step. So we had students uh, towards the end of their three years making instruments within about two months mm -hmm. or maybe faster than that. It's not necessarily, we, we don't try to beat the, beat the re speed record because there's a, hundreds if not thousands of instruments coming from the factories and so there's no like a shortage of very quickly made violins around anymore but uh, rather we try to have fairly high level right away so to have a very high level even for the best makers they don't make a violin in a week they will take longer to, to just take care of each aspect doesn't mean the longer is better there's the right amount of time that makes a good violin mm -hmm. so if i rush some process or i just delay some process it's not the way to go we try to have the right amount of time spent for each time and move on and that sometimes for professional maker it could be they'll make uh, between six and maybe eight violins a year and once they reach a higher level that's they also can make a very good one but if somebody wants to make 30 violins a year they probably start manufacturing and the level is then is it we're goes talking about different instruments. Right, right. And then students here, uh, they get to, uh, they own everything that they make. That's correct. Uh, and so, which also means that if they have the opportunity, they can uh, sell those instruments. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a, quickly becomes kind of a complex uh, uh, conversation. But I think that the, the point that I want to make is that I think there's a sense of ownership uh, that students have here in in uh, being able to make that instrument, uh, whether they're going to play it themselves, to give it to a friend or family member, or or to try and sell it. Roman, I want to ask you because I feel like out of so many of the programs here, this this industry is so specific uh, that there's not a lot of things to do. We just came from carpentry. And you know, the, it's such a big industry, you could help your neighbor to rip off a deck and rebuild it. Uh, you're not gonna find a luthier that's gonna say, hey, jump in and help me repair this violin. Many people have a musical background, but what, what are the kind of experiences or what are the qualities that you look for in a, uh, it, you know, in a candidate? Yeah, well, because this is a, work that requires being behind the bench. So the person who, who can enjoy working with their hands behind the bench for hours, a few hours uh, a day is already a good candidate. Person who's interested in the musical aspect is good because we outside, when, once we nice make this nice box and nice scroll and carve everything well, then we put strings on it and then the journey for the violin starts, it becomes an instrument. So we need to we need to understand that we have to be good with workmanship, but also think about the sound. So it's a it's a combination. The person who who can work with their hands is good, has a artistic side that they can uh, enjoy shaping, making forms and shapes. But also with the musical ear, it helps because eventually without the customer, we have to adjust the sound. So it's good to paying attention to this. Um, also, there's a technical aspect for it. We don't do things just free-handed. Some measurements are very precise. So we have to have this, this uh, ability to work with the short to uh, small tolerances and be very, very precise in some places when we lack in the position and, and, and my very small amounts of uh, uh, measurement, wise speaking, make a big difference. And then there are other places where we can be a little more free and, and we can, in, in some areas, for example, when we varnish the instrument, we can 
we can choose colors and then we can play around with our palette a little bit. So it's a, in some places we can be a little more free, so a little bit artistic. In other places we have to be very technical and accurate. In other places we have to think about the, the music. So sometimes musicians who like to, who, who, who can envision themselves working at the bench could be a good candidate. Sometimes people from the art areas can be good too, but they have to uh, then uh, make up a little bit with the instruments. So we give violin lessons here as well so that they can understand the sound part of it. We also had students who are from technical background who are engineers. They liked uh, the engineering part of the violin because there is this, this whole system of tensions that and angles that comes into it and they were drawn to it. And it, it is very good because they have already some experience in that, but they have to as well uh, get into uh, creating process when they can shape things with their hands. So we cannot just buy part and then install it. We have to usually make that part. So this is the making part. So it, it takes the round person <laughs> overall with, with these characteristics, but they have definitely someone has to enjoy being, being behind the bench and work. That's, that's very helpful. Um, so we are with a live audience and uh, um, questions can come in. Uh, we had a question because I know there's a lot of hand tooling that happens here, uh, but there's also a little bit of uh, machining. Will you show us the machine shop and talk to us about uh, what types of machining uh, might happen? I'm going to leave you now. I'll oh, okay. You. Sorry, I'll see you in the store at noon, so I'll see you there. All right, we'll All see right. you there, Kristen. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. So, yeah, this is our machine room. So for us as violin makers, what we need is the band saw is very helpful. We can use hand saw, just the frame saw for, for cutting the outline, but the band saw helps. And we have a three band saws, as you can see. So one is the, the high quality made in Italy. It's sold by Laguna here in the US. Uh, dust collector attached, it's, it's a standard now because they're made, uh, the, these pencils are made that they have to have a dust collector, otherwise there is no escape for the dust. Okay. So we really enjoy this machine and we just use it using it mostly to cut the outlines of the instruments and the scrolls. We don't really cut many other things. The blade is a narrower blade, five millimeters, so it will make these turns that we need to make. And we just save it for those precise cuts for the scrolls now. This one is more of an, an industry standard that it used to be everywhere in the shop had them most, most of the time. It's a de Delta uh, Benso, it's an older. Doesn't have actually, it's older now, doesn't have a, a dust collector attachment yet. And the retrofitting wasn't really uh, the best, the working the best. So we just have it as it originally was, except the fence is new. But we like this for very small cuts. I just turn it on, cut a little piece, and get it off. So basically, it's not much. Done. Yeah, you're not making a lot of dust. Yeah, and we use it for this. This is just just very nice to use. Very easy to change the blade. So we use it for a lot of variable cuts. Uh, now this vents up here is a jet. We use it for resawing. Has a wider blade here. It's a it's a half inch plus minus, and uh, basically. This this uh, works very well for our straight cuts and basically resawing. So we can resaw the cello back or resaw the uh, violin back. Mostly same thing. Don't use it on any other wood except the solid wood. So when where do we cut the plywood? If we have to cut the plywood, we change the blade because the plywood has a glue and usually dulls the blade. So it's the best thing for us to change the blade. And most of the time, if we use small plywood pieces, we use a delta because it's easy to exchange the blade. If we need bigger, we will use this one. But uh, very often, then we, we change the blade. I we can't think of many straight cuts, but maybe the where the neck attaches to the body seems straight. Yeah. Well, so initially, when we have a basically a wood for violin, are these larger wedges, and we cut them in half, open them up, glue them together. So it's basically pre-cuts at the beginning. Also, when we make a neck block, we cut it. So when there's a cello play, we have to open this blade quite fast, the clearance has to be pretty pretty serious. So for example, for cello resawing, if we have a two piece bag, maybe we have to go this high. So there is definitely enough straight cuts in the preparation. It's, it's a little bit more like if we were mailing, we don't really make violin with the band, so but we pre, uh, we prepare material. Like rough cuts. Yeah, just, just start it with, because 
we done by Lambert. We buy this wood shape wedges. We, we can look at. Oh, I'd love to see the the library of wood and hear a little bit about that too. Basically, from that step, we come here, make some straight cuts to just uh, have some planes, and then from there on we go to there. Cool. I see a drill press over there. That's for maybe peg holes. Yeah, drill press press is just used for peg holes, pretty much. That Sometimes when we make a picture or something else that needs uh, holes, but most of the time for the violin, just for the tank holes. That's great. Are those, I'm looking over here at some of your scrap wood here, and it looks like, it looks like a piano soundboard. Uh, what, what, what do you use those for? Yeah, we, we enjoy all kinds of pieces of wood. Piano soundboards have a good quality Sitka spruce very often. And sometimes we use it for samples for the violins. We can they, they can be smaller now. We can carve the samples out of it. It's, some of them are hundred years old pieces of wood, very stable and very good wood for for this type of. So samples is small piece. Usually the thickness is right. So when they're well split, we will use this. Also can provide repair wood if some there is if there was a violin that needs an edge replacement, for example, uh -huh. and has a similar color, we would possibly use it. But here we don't do it as much uh, of this work as much as they're just for our samples. We also do samples exper uh, experiment. So we have a different type of spruce. We never stray outside of the spruce because that seems to be true for and tried for many years material, but we will experiment for types of spruce, wider grain, narrower grain from this forest from that forest and Sitka spruce is one of them. That's cool. And it, what a great example of, uh, of upcycling within the programs. Uh, this. It's probably been going on for even before the term upcycling uh, yes. came around. So that's kind of cool. We also use from piano. We, uh, if there are some old pianos and the, there are nice shaped keys, we will use black keys for our uh, nuts and saddles for the violins. And that's very stable wood, wonderful as well. Great. Uh, we're close to the varnish room. So should we go yes. there next? And So lots of nice light in this room by design. And then these cabinets here were built by the carpentry program a few years ago uh, for storage. That's correct. So we needed specific size and specific drawers and the carpentry, it was so, so great, great for us. They were, they offered to make us these nice cabinets. So I'm very grateful and happy. Uh, what we have here, mostly varnish uh, equipment, we do have some brushes. These are these are brushes mostly for alcohol varnishing that we do. We also do some oil varnishing. And we got some molars, some things. So basically, it's a, it's, it's a storage of the equipment. And then on the other side, we have a flammable cabinet. This is for the storage of the varnish itself. So basically, we can feel safer because if there's some alcohol uh, in, in some jar, we, don't, we, we want to have an inflammable cabinet. So if we open this, the, each student gets a box for their materials and they keep, can keep it. And basically this way we have a little more organized uh, storage system. Once they start filling up, then we can go through the box, they can go, they can look and empty some things and get some things uh, replaced. Cool. As part of the table here is this, is in the middle we have some uh, lab uh, quality uh, hot plates and uh, those help us cook varnishes, heat up to the right uh, temperature and keep them at the right temperature for a longer time. So it's a very good, helpful, uh, basic thing. Making. Good. I can see there's all these uh, the safety plexiglass walls that were made by I know one of your students is a student worker who yeah. worked on the crew over the summer and this is a another theme now uh, that you know we're in this uh, pandemic situation uh, where the the response team has come up with a plan that includes making these things uh, so that we can still operate safely and effectively and I think that's cool. Roman, I want to. Uh, it occurs to me and a question that I get a lot about violin making is I feel like it is in some ways such a, a, a mystery or so esoteric for people. Uh, you know, sometimes people will make these assumptions of like, 
oh, well, why don't I just make a factory made one or why don't I buy a factory made one? And I feel like in seeing the work and in talking with you over the years, uh, one of the things that I've come to understand is we're in a place where the making uh, is at a very high level and the robots have not been able to catch up with the human quality work that's being produced. And, uh, and then even production factories, even though they've increased their quality uh, over the years, they are still very far away from being able to reach the kind of quality that the caliber of maker uh, that comes through a program like this uh, is able to do. Will you uh, talk about that for a little bit? Yes, I think that for violin, very often there's small, the tolerances can be small. So, so small difference in measurement can make a big difference in sound, for example. And for factories, it's difficult, although there will be human working and making uh, arches and thicknesses. But it's difficult if they have very short amount of time when they can check things, they can go very close and it has to be done because the next violin comes in. Make. So that right there will make a set apart the handmade violin from factory made, although it's also by somebody else's hands, but there's multiple hands from uh, specializing only one aspect and that has to be put together. It's a uh, it's more industrial way and it creates decent project product, but uh, the very much handmade violin by a skilled hand, it's better. I want to emphasize skill hand because somebody can just make the violin uh, without much learning with sample and maybe be able to put it together. The problem is then the factory violin may be better because some because they're at least consistent. So someone who learns well, they will be uh, they will need to learn enough and train themselves enough so they can be above the factory level. And once they can do this, now they are really better than factory and they make better instruments than factory. So it's this it's this handmade uh, situation when some handmade if it's not a good handmade, it's basically the handmade product can vary from uh, fairly low level to very high level. But when we take the handmade to the highest level, they're still the best. And uh, even behind the robot, they have to be a person uh, somehow programming it. And if they, they never made the violin, they can analyze, but certain things can escape. So for the skilled ma maker, they still are able to make a better instrument. That's great. Thank you for that. And I feel like, you know, what this is about is it's an organic process. Uh, you know, around human skill and hand skills and working with organic materials, uh, you know, and to be able to know the instrument in such a comprehensive way that when you're at that place where whatever that material is saying to you that needs to be done to make that shape, you're right there, you're, you're in it. We got, uh, there's a question here, um, which I can answer quickly. Um, uh, and it's a question we get often about, you know, do we, do we make bows in this program? And the answer is no. Uh, bow making is a, a, a completely uh, separate but related industry. Uh, and it requires, uh, you know, many of the same skills and talents that, that violin makers uh, use, but it is very different. And while this program is our longest at 30 months, uh, every moment here is precious. And uh, all the time that we put in is around making these violins uh, and then learning to repair them. So I uh, just wanted to share that for our, for our at-home audience. We're with Roman Barnes, uh, the head of the Violin Making and Repair Program. Yes, and uh, I'd like to add to this that we can scratch surface of, of many different disciplines, but, but we more focus on making one thing very well. So we try to make a violin very well. And that means we make one violin and that's why there's a, we make six violins. We could say, okay, the student makes one violin, they're ready to graduate. But they think they have to be able to repeat it and make it again. So after a few consistent instruments, there is some level established. And and we don't want to just scratch the surface of bow making, maybe make a bow and, and say we are bow makers. There, is, there are courses in schools when they teach bow making and, and they all they do is just bow making. So all we do is just violin making. And then it's the best thing is find symbiotic relationship with, with the bow maker when they can provide bow, we can provide violin and together we make this whole thing. Violin without the bow is not a violin. We have to have a <laughs> bow to play. So we have a greatest respect and and, uh, and friendships with bow makers, but we can't, uh, we, we have to focus on violin just to skip. That's great. 
in in talking with you, Roman, I'm I'm struck by a few things that tie into the overall ethos of North Bennett Street School. One of those is repetition. You're making these six violins, and so you're you know through repetition, you're creating muscle memory. Uh, you're improving every cycle, hopefully. Uh, and uh, you know we've got the opportunity to get feedback both from the instrument and from being uh, with you as the maestro. Uh, this is right in line with our educational methodology, which uh, Brock mentioned uh, and was mentioned yesterday, and that's Sloyd, uh, the Sloyd method. And then the other thing connected to this uh, is you know North Bennett Street School was founded in part uh, during the arts and crafts movement. And as a part of that, and as I'm listening to Roman here talk about uh, the difference between, you know, uh, factory made and handmade, uh, this is just has such a direct resonance uh, with what the arts and crafts movement was. It was a human reaction uh, to the mechanical industrial revolution, uh, which in part was about making things in a high production level uh, you know, for uh, less money uh, to be able to share with people. And this is really about uh, kind of maintaining the human spirit, the comprehensive quality uh, from beginning to end to violin making. And it's, uh, it's happening here. And, uh, and I'm lucky, I get to come here a lot. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I get to bear witness to this uh, pretty much on a daily basis, uh, which, is, which is very nice. Uh, should we go check out the, do you want to share with us some more about yes. the varnish room yes, here? We're almost done here, but I'd like to add some to your thought about every new knowledge can cause uh, ending of an old knowledge. And, and basically new ways of making instruments, for example, the 19th century factories when they made a lot of this violence, uh, caused the loss of the classic Cremonese. Uh, methods of making, like precise making, so on. But we had to do a little re reverse engineering. What we are happy now, or what we are enjoying right now, is modern technology, including medical scanning, CT scanning, and examination of the instruments, very high quality photography also. Helps us to decode certain uh, certain things that were made in Cremona and just forgotten. So today, we we cultivate that, cultivate this great old knowledge, we try to carry it over and forward that was done in Cremona. And basically why this is so so good and important because the Cremonese way instruments are so good and important. And the factory is never caught up to those levels. So so now we try to carry that hand. And for us, uh, I, there's a great thing about uh, factory making in, in industrialization because things get maybe easier accessible for more people. But there are certain components such as the best violin that they have to be made in the way of by kind of artistic person who is dedicated to it. Cool. Thank you, Roman. We have about 15 minutes left here. Uh, we're going to head back into the bench room and uh, hopefully get a chance to see what students are doing and maybe talk with them. Uh, to your point about the, the Cremonese makers, uh, I just wanna share, you know, the students have a lot of access. Uh, you know, the Chris Rooning and Sons uh, is a shop in Boston where students will visit. Uh, we'll be visiting there later this year uh, and, and students will be able to see and hear and handle uh, some uh, very beautiful and historic uh, instruments. All right, looking for a show of hands. Who wants to share with our live audience what you're up to? I can show. Okay, cool. Uh, one of the lesser seen parts of an instrument that happens on the inside of the top plate uh, called the bass bar. And uh, it's a separate piece of wood spruce that we fit to the inside. So I have my top plate here, uh, with the F holes cut out and my positioning of the bridge uh, the base bar fits in a very specific spot um, underneath one of the bridge feet. And what it'll do is it provides some support and stability. So the top plate with the pressure of the strings won't flex too much underneath the bridge. Uh, and it'll help distribute some of the pressure uh, along the entire surface of the top plate. Because on this side, we'll have the sound post 
uh, underneath the other bridge foot. On this side, we have the baseball. And in order to get a good fit, uh, we'll spend quite a bit of time uh, using some chalk. We'll rub it on the inside of the plate here um, with some positioning cleats to keep it in the same spot. And what we can do is take our base bar, uh, put it in its correct position, and then just very gently uh, move it a little bit. And then you'll be able to see where the chalk marks are on uh, the surface and try to take a little bit off with the knife uh, or I guess whatever tool you might choose and um, get it closer to a fit. So we call that chalk fitting the base bar. And when we get a good fit, we'll end up uh, gluing this in place and uh, we shape it. Um, so it's not gonna be straight across like this. It's gonna have a little bit of a curve to it. Um, and that way it provides a certain level of flexibility across the top plate. So we are constantly trying to balance uh, the materials that we're using um, and their ability to uh, flex and provide stability at the same time. So um, it's a very important part to sound and we like to make sure that we put the time and effort into uh, trying to get it right the first time. This don't want to have to string up an instrument, realize that there's something wrong with the bass bar, take the whole thing apart, and, and it immediately becomes a restoration project instead of uh, a pleasant first sounding experience. That's great. And uh, now we learned in the machine room that uh, that you guys upcycle uh, some of the spruce that's from a soundboard. Is this this looks like new oh, stock yeah. to me? Is it? Yeah. Did you make this out of new stock? This is new stock. Um, the soundboard stuff is really great because it's so old mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the grains on the spruce tend to be really tight. Um, we look for a specific grain spacing for base bars to be a little bit tighter than the grain spacing on our top plate. Uh, this piece for me happened to be a good candidate um, and a consistent piece. Sometimes the tough thing with the bass bars and the pianos um, is how they get taken out. So there's a lot of processing involved uh, into getting those down to the right size. And we have a nice stock of bass bars here at the, the workshop. Nice. Well, so. so we're with uh, Nathan Abbey and uh, Nathan uh, is you graduated already, right? Right. Uh, so that's awesome. Congratulations. Uh, and. Uh, Nathan is here helping out. And then I mentioned in a few different um, uh, tour spaces that we were, um, a lot of the work that's been done to make this place safe uh, with especially the, the plexiglass, um, uh, I was calling the plexi crew over the summer, uh, but a lot of student workers from different programs and Nathan was on that crew. And so many of the things that you see uh, around in our tour, uh, like, I don't know if you had your hand on your own that's here, but as we look down the bench room here, uh, it almost looks like that infinity mirror, but we're really looking uh, uh, at these uh, these nice safety walls that are in between all of these benches and people are uh, spaced very nicely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's less intrusive in person than it looks on camera. Um, when I was taking pictures of these as we were putting them up, I thought, felt kind of closed and tight, but being here during the day and working at your bench, it's, I gotta say, you hardly notice them. Yeah, it feels very open uh, in, in being in this space. And uh, cool, thank you, thank you for sharing. Sure. Hi, how are you? Hi again. Hi again. I don't know if everybody saw you earlier, uh, so it looks like you're working on a neck. Uh, part of my superpower is stating the obvious, but I'm going to let you or ask you if you'll share us some of the details of the work that you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, right now I'm just establishing the general outline. Um, uh, as you can see, the difference between this. Uh, it looks like a Minecraft violin. Right? Yeah, it's 2D, <laughs> like pixelated violin or something. But this, something like this is inside of it somewhere. So before I start, um, 
you know, carving and shaping it, I just want to make sure the outline is exactly um, how I'd like it to be, which is based off of. Yeah, it looks like there's a mold there that you're working with. Um, you mean this guy right here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is actually a cast of um, a Stradivari scroll. Okay. Um, so it's just nice to have this around um, for reference to um, look at um, as I'm shaping this. Um, but I actually established that outline of this from this um, template from a, a different Strad instrument, actually. Okay. Um, but they're, you know, pretty similar. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's good to have them. Cool, and I can see there's little pinholes around. Uh, and I'm sorry, my my uh, uh, my terms are are no, kind of layperson here. <laughs> uh, but the pinholes they kind of go in a in that spiral. And I guess you're gonna uh, when you get the your your blank in a place uh, that you're happy with, then you're gonna you're gonna mark where those things are, and it's gonna yeah, show you the trail. I already have them in here. Oh, let me see if I can see. see those details. There we go. Yeah. So yeah, those are there to um, uh, transfer the size and, and curves of the of the different turns of the scroll. So those are going to be used when it comes time um, time to saw down um, and establish the rough outline of the different turns in the scroll. Yeah. Cool. Do you have a favorite part uh, to making out of curiosity? Because I think the scroll looks so cool to me. But yeah, the scroll is definitely fun. I, I'm a big fan of um, arching, actually, which is what I was just working on on this instrument a little bit earlier today. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a uh, like one of the less technical parts, I guess I'd say. It feels a lot more like organic, like shaping and carving. Right. So I really get into that, and you can really sort of establish the character of the instrument. Yeah. Cool. Um, through. Um, the way that you arch it, um, both in terms of look and sound. So, yeah. Nice, and I can see also on your bench, there's another, and I, I'm, it's a, a mold or a form. Uh, yeah, this is another cast. A cast, <laughs> cast. yes. Cast are, I'll get it right by the end of this, I promise. Casts are um, really, um, really helpful um, in making, um, and we're lucky enough here to have quite a few. They're pretty precious. Um, uh, for makers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just good to have for reference um, as I'm making my own arch, sort of and those understanding are, the general shape that um, I'm making. Very cool. It's like on your bench. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no so, so you also have Ada doing something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Daniel. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Hey, Ada, how are you? We're here with our live audience and uh, checking out uh, as many uh, aspects of violin making uh, as we can in the short time that we have. Yeah, so I am starting to hollow out this plate. So I finished the external curves and now I'm doing the internal work. And this is just very rough stages. And then this one is actually finer. So this is the outside curve, the arch, and then this is the inside. And I'm I'm no longer using the large gouge. Okay. But it's still pretty not close to being finished. It's about a millimeter thick in these areas. Right. Thicker than it will be. And you use a micrometer for that and yeah, feel. I use this. It's called a caliper, and a it has caliper. little feelers that show me exactly how thick something is. So this is just over four and a half millimeters in the very center, and then it gets thinner outside. Yeah, I feel like this would be easy if you just had to shape one side, but you're yeah. trying to shape both sides to match. Yeah, and I'm also working with the thickness and stiffness of the wood. So this is a really light piece of wood, and it's already very flexible. So I'm not going to take it as thin as I would on a stiffer piece because it would be too weak. So we work with weight and thickness and stiffness, and then you can tap it in various places to get a tone. And that is another aspect of how we determine exact thickness of the plates, which has a strong effect on the sound. That's cool. So, 
And and Ada, where where are you in the in sort of the length of the the program? Is this the first violin that you're that you're making here? This is this is my third violin. This is a piece of my second violin. So I've been building two in tandem. Okay. And I keep them at just about the same point, so I can do one step on the second one and then the same thing on the third one and reflect on what I learned and what I should change and practice it right away. So it's but, a slightly different process. It means I do this a same step for a long time, but it's helpful to learn exactly what matters and what's less important, things like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool, like it's economical in some way uh, and it's a nice, uh, like a courageous reach yeah. Uh, to take to take two on at the same time. Yeah, and I also have two more that I just started that I'm not really working on, but I do have five violins going right now. Nice, nice. So yeah. you're five sevenths of the way. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um, we've got just about another minute, and then we're gonna head out. Uh, Elliot, what do you got going on? Um, I'm working on sort of starting to establish the outline of my back plate. So it's when you're doing the shape of the whole instrument, uh, you wind up with these lines that you scribe on that are kind of hard to see because they're very accurate and very small. Right. Um, Trust us. Yeah. Yeah. And you, uh, you wind up cutting it like with a, with a knife um, and you just try to cut as nice of a curve as you can up right to the line but not past it um, and you're just trying to basically create in this situation I'm trying to create a plate that's as close as I can to a specific strap um, cool yeah that's great Elliot thank you so much yeah uh, Ada thank you too uh, thanks to everybody here uh, in violin making uh, for letting us visit uh, Roman Daniel take care Veronica, thank you. Nathan, all right. Take care, everybody. Have a great day. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, there you are. Hello. Hi, Melly. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Let me Welcome situate to the my... studio. Oh, thank you. Welcome <laughs> to our open house. Let me open up my gallery view here so I can see you clearly. Sure. Um, everyone who's watching, um, this is Melly Finelli um, or Melissa Finelli of um, Melly Finelli jewelry studios yeah. <laughs> um and tell us where you are again i'm in fort point at midway artist studios great yeah it's a great and building filled with creative people doing all sorts of things cool um and so we're going to speak to so melly is a graduate of the jewelry making program and she makes these oh, incredible God. pieces that you can already see in my hand here. So we're gonna talk about these and I wanted to get a close up of it because it's just outrageously <laughs> awesome. Thanks, that's a good description. <laughs> yeah, well, you have amazing descriptions on your website. It's incredible. Your, your poetry with your, with, with your descriptions of your rings is just spot on. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I feel like they are all, they all have such a big personality, even if they're a smaller ring, that they have something to say. So. Yeah, <laughs> yes, like this one. Um, this one in particular is, it's called the Not So Tiny Bubbles Ring, uh, yeah. and it's brushed and oxidized sterling silver, and it sells for 1100 And can you tell me about it a little bit? Well, during the pandemic and being home, I was just thinking about all the little things that really make me happy. And it really is so literal that it, to me, I was thinking about blowing bubbles with my nephews. And I wanted to kind of honor that memory with something that I can see, which is a ring, because it's like I can't really see the other things I wear. Mm -hmm. So I could daydream about those fun times. 
Yes. So that is just meant to be a very happy memory. I love it. Can I just jump in here? Um, somebody's saying they can't see the jewelry. Are we, can, can everybody see this, this third frame here with the ring? I can see it. Okay, good. All right. Um, hang on one second. Bear with me. Maybe that's better for everybody. There you go. Okay. You're a perfect okay. model. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, please, nobody judge my hands. It's, it's minus a million degrees today and we're expecting a snowstorm. So just, it's okay. <laughs> so um, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to make sure that everyone could see this amazing yeah. ring. And I'm gonna take it off of my dry hands too so that everybody can see the backs of this. It's and I do just... love to have a little hidden detail um, underneath. A lot of my pieces have something on the back that speaks to the whole piece. And in this case, are you referring to all of these holes here? All the holes, the little bubbles on the side there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're secrets, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And they're happy secrets. <laughs> yes. You also sent us some of your incredible earrings that we've shown. Um, you, you've submitted them to our various annual celebration of craft exhibits through the years, and they're amazing. I have not had the chance to put them on our online store yet, but uh, anybody can go to your website if you want to share that with us and see all of your amazing, your earring collections and oh, all the things. Thanks. And tell us what your website is. Oh, again. sorry, sorry. It's uh, oh, okay. melvinfinellijewelry.com. Yes. Yeah. Lots um, of work on there. Yeah. So before I jump to the other, our other insanely gorgeous ring, can you tell us about your studio practice and your studio space a little bit? Well, my studio space is everything about my world. I live here. I work here. It's filled with uh, personal collections that inspire me. Um, I've been doing uh, traveling for craft shows for, geez, 20 years. Wow. And so <laughs> I've collected lots of things by artists that I admire from all over the country. So my studio is filled with like all of my friends. And there are things that I can sit and look at and contemplate. And it kind of connects me to the world that in which I live. Um, and my studio practice is something that I've been a little challenged with lately, but um, I go in every day. I touch face with the studio and I always hope for the best. Um, focus has been a little hard uh, during the pandemic for me personally, but I come in here and try to get in a rhythm and I either have it or I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but I always believe in keep, like keeping in motion. And so when I'm in the studio, I actually only have one chair and that's to work on my flex shaft. I work standing and I feel like I kind of dance around the space, going from one project to the next, making parts, thinking, but I feel like keeping in motion is what keeps my work going. I mean, you can see that in your work anyway, in your pieces that they are, they move. And quite <laughs> literally the next ring that we're gonna talk about actually has moving parts to it, so. Um, and, yeah. and your earrings too. I mean, all of your earrings, if you can show us the one that you have on, oh, sure. they're all, um, you know, they're all moving. Nothing is static. So yeah. I love that that represents who you are, yeah. what you just shared with us. <laughs> I guess I'm very consistent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what are the um, headphones behind you? Just tell me what that, what do you use those for? And what are they on? What do you hang them on? My, um, one of my favorites. Um, my beautiful anvil. Um, I have two of them. This one is from 1918. Um, and I got it at uh, the tool barn up in Maine. Mm -hmm. And it 
is filled with texture from its past. And I love, there's not any finished surface on it. It's just gnarly. And I love that the texture from this amazing tool is a part of my work. Mm -hmm. And that is as well as all my hammers. I've never bought a new hammer in my life. They wow. are all, they all just have this beautiful past and scrapes and dents and nicks. And I love that, um, again, it's, it reflects its past in my work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess you could say that that's something that you would see in the patina of this ring. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, it's not bright and shiny. It's not no. super clean. Nope. Um, yeah. It's just more that. about the material and the mm -hmm. tools. I'm just going to put this on one more time before I move on to the next ring. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> So you can see the scale. a beautiful gift from a, an artist friend who noticed that I did not wear ear protection when I hammered. And I do a lot of some of my work is like really thick pieces of metal that is like forged and stretched. Mm -hmm. So I was gifted these and I wear them every time I hammer. And I have an extra pair in case I have any visitors uh, to the studio, like my nephews or nieces, so they yes. are protected as well. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Safety first. Yep. Um, I'm gonna. Move, <laughs> I'm gonna move on to this absolutely bananas ring that. Um, so this is called. <laughs> oh, look at my. I'm, I'm a hand model. Oh now. my gosh. This is called the Golden Beehive Ring. This is 18 karat gold and sterling silver. Is that correct? Yep. There's and an diamond. interior cup that's uh, sterling silver. I see. You can't really see the interior no. cup, can you? Covered in gold. Wow. <laughs> and it just has these little abstract parts and pieces to it. Sorry, I'm struggling with this second camera it's very weird um but it just has these little you know notes here on the side and i'm going to take it back off and all of this cluster of what would you call these well i <laughs> i see that ring as your own private cheering section I see it as a little stadium of people that are like, yeah, go. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually how I see that ring. Um, I find gold is such a serious material and it, you know, is so precious. Mm. And I love working with it in a more playful thought. So it doesn't have to be so serious. That's so true with this ring. And this is, this is the movable part here. With the, it's a perfect fidget factor. Yes. You can roll it in the inside of your hand and play with those little discs. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's... Um, and I also see, I can't, uh, I can't really get my camera to focus on it, but these diamonds that are, in, that are set in the little prongs on the side. Yeah. I love that detail. Little touch of sparkle because it's a top heavy ring. Um, so it, it does tend to lean over. And I thought, well, it's beautiful to see that the lovely rings, but why not have some diamonds pointing up at you? Ah. <laughs> so that is, you know, I've never heard of somebody not ignoring the rest of the band. <laughs> I love it. Thanks. So it's this, you can, it is so happy. <laughs> this you can buy, um, you can actually buy it on our online store, but you can also buy it through Melly's online store and all of, and see all of her other amazing jewelry. And, and even your branding on your, on your Instagram is so spot on. I Yay. love that. It's been a project, um, but I'm really having fun with it and having pops of color and, it just kind of speaks to who I am and I think uh, I'm really happy with it. Yes, I love it. And when you were a student here, you were in our old, in the, in the 
the other building at North Bennett, weren't you? It was. Wow. It was, it was amazing. What I've was always that? felt like if the walls could speak, like it just oozed with like this intense feeling of the past. Hmm. Where are you from, Melly? I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts. So <laughs> I'm a Massachusetts girl, grew up in Southern New Hampshire. What, um, what was something that, um, that, was, that got you to a moment of where you're like, I am going to go study jewelry at North Bennett Street School? Um, it was a very, I felt like it was so by chance. Um, I had always been doing something in the arts. Um, and I always really struggled with like having this personal challenge that I felt like I need to keep moving forward in, a, in art, like painting and drawing just never felt satisfying. And um, I, this was back in the phone book days. Yes. I, just decided I was going to look up jewelry in Boston and North Bennett came up and I was at work and I called the school and set up um, a like a tour to go check out the school mm -hmm. and I had never picked up a torch barely picked up a hammer but I walked into that metals room and I just, my whole, my head exploded. <laughs> I was like, okay, how do I do this? How do yeah. I make this happen? Yeah. And um, it was the best decision I ever made. Um, wow. I'm endlessly challenged by my material. There's never a lack of exploration and curiosity. I just feel so lucky that I do what I do. I love it. Mm. We are so lucky to have you making these objects too. They're just incredible. Thank you. Yes, and thank you so much for being with us today. Oh my gosh, a delight, thanks. Yeah, um, if you wanna hang tight here, I'm gonna bring our next um, maker in. Mitch Gundrum's gonna come in and do some, show us some tools. So um, I'm, sh oh, he's right there. Oh, good. <laughs> so he can come in and say hi to you, Melly. Oh, perfect. So don't be, I'm, I'm going to close you out in a second, but thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. This yeah. has been great. It's been awesome. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And everybody, Mitch Gundrum is going to come in right now. I hope that we can be in the same frame safely. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, this is Mitch. He is a bookbinding student, currently a bookbinding student. Um, and he sells, he, well, he makes Delrin bookbinding tools and folders and is going to show us how those, well, briefly how those are made and what he uses them for and why he prefers Delrin as a, as a material. And um, if you care to purchase one, we sell them through our online store, which ultimately end up in his hands where he ships, he makes them and ships them to you. So let me get this where your hands are. Okay, great. And... Oh, wow. What is this multi-tone one here? Oh, boy. Wow. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. You went, oh, that's, a, okay, gotcha. That's a test. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I make Delrin where I make a bunch of different types of tools, um, but we're looking at a box tool that I make or a kind of a multi-tool um, that I use sort of in tandem with kind of our normal bone folders. Um, Delrin is a little bit softer. It's a little bit um, easier to work than bone. Um, and it's great for sort of more conservation or... Um, I'm gonna pull this out so people can hear you. Worries. Let's, yeah, keep going. Let's see if we can hear you better. Okay. Um, or maybe, oh no, I can't unmute that. How's that? Getting better. You, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, I use Delrin a lot in conservation and in box making because um, I want a material that's a little bit softer, a little bit smoother when working with old materials and especially working with cloth. I actually have a, a little demo here, just a, um, sort of a, a mock-up of um, 
a clamshell box tray. Mm -hmm. um, just to give an example of how I would use something like this. So this is, this is the box tool. Um, it has a long taper uh, on the front, tapered on the sides, long edges for smoothing out long areas uh, of glued up paper or um, cloth or leather. And then it has a double bevel on uh, the back here. You can see. Um, and I love using this for getting inside of corners. Um, I use the point for getting deep inside, um, putting cloth down while it's glued up. And anybody who's made boxes before knows that materials like this, when you really try to squish them into tight corners and edges, uh, they burnish very easily and you'll get marks. Um, something like bone, which is naturally harder um, than something like this, which is a thermoplastic, can, can mark up these things really easily. So I use this tool whenever I want to apply pressure, but I don't want to risk marring up my materials. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have a, a little bit of a breakdown here, um, just kind of how it's made. I actually just buy a, Delrin comes in sort of a four foot bar of varying dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so I start by measuring it out, um, marking out the shapes that I want, sawing out the, the major points, and then it goes from there. I take a rasp and sort of put, uh, go. sort of put down the... Uh-oh. Uh-oh, sorry, everyone. Sorry about that. Technology. There we go. Um, I, I use a rasp and sandpaper to get the, the basic shape. And then this is actually the tool that I use all the time. It's in my own, my own toolbox. Um, so it's polished super smooth. I go from 150 to, to 220, 400, 600, and 1200 uh, sandpaper to get a really smooth, uh, fine polish on them. And, and that's the tool. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Those are so great. And what are we, what are we seeing here though? Is that just your marking to show where you yes. gotcha? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the, anybody here with us today was also on our book binding tour yesterday, but they, um, or I don't remember when I was still bleeding into one. Um, but Jeff showed us this, um, your Delrin blocks that you put sanding paper on mm -hmm. um, to actually sharp to as like a homemade sharpening system. Yeah. Um, and why is that? Like, what is, you know, why do you use Delrin for that? Delrin is great because it's super workable. Um, I think he mentioned, I was, I was listening while you yeah. guys were talking. He mentioned that they started using aluminum um, for that project. And, you know, you, you get sort of the factory made bar, but then you have to really smooth it out. Cause when you're talking about a knife blade, you really don't want to have any sort of ridges or machine marks in that blit in the, in that plate or that's going to translate when you're trying to sharpen. Mm -hmm. um, with Delrin is uh, you sort of get it the same way, but it's a lot easier to work um, and sort of smooth out. You scrape it, sand it, you get a really fine finish on it. And um, much like Teflon that sort of has a super low coefficient, uh, friction coefficient, won't scuff things up. Uh, Tef uh, Delrin is, has a similar coefficient, but it doesn't have the health risks associated with creating Tough dust one. or that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, you, you saw up there, you know, they were sanding and there was dust flying. Um, yes. You know, gratefully, everybody's wearing, we would have been wearing masks if we weren't already all wearing masks. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel a lot safer working with something like this that's more inert. Like mm -hmm. um, if you go to our online store where we sell these for Mitch, um, it, we were linked to his website where you have actual bone tools as well. Didn't you collect some or find some bones or buy some bones from somebody that visited us recently? And mm -hmm. what were those? Yeah, we had a great, a great workshop uh, with Jim Croft last fall. Um, who lives out in the wilderness and sort of collects these bones and has people that know that he works with bone and natural materials. So we used elk bone, leg bones for a lot of that. They're long, they're hard because they're wild animals. The bone is really dense, uh, which is perfect for what we use it for, um, more sedentary animals like 
cows, the, the bone gets super porous. And mm. when you try to shape it, you get all those sort of air pockets and marks. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you like myself who didn't really learn this until I started working here, when they say bone folder, it is literally bone. It is literally bone. <laughs> it's not um, bone. It's not like crab with a K. It's actually bone. Yeah. Uh, it's shaped, you know, any way you like it. I have one that was actually sort of shaped like a tear, a long teardrop. And that sort of inspired actually the, my design for this, because I really liked having that double bevel and sort of um, the, rounded off but smooth edge to be able to to paste out large areas mm -hmm. um, and yeah after working with uh, Jim Croft and Brian Beidler and um, Jeff Peachy on some of the tools and some of their techniques um, I ran with some of my own designs um, I picked up some antique deer antlers at a uh, antique store for a dollar and I was like I can probably work with these and sort of the same deal you know sort of look at the raw shape and say how can I work this into something that I can use mm -hmm. um, start with the rasp get the rough shape sand it polish it um, I have some really interesting ones yeah that are available like you said on my store yeah this also speaks to this recurring theme in our all of these programs this past three days about um uh, tools and as a maker here you have the ability to and you or you learn to make specifically the tool that you need for a specific purpose mm -hmm. um, and something that Jeff said so eloquently was um, that's the difference between an amateur and a professionally trained bookbinder in this case mm -hmm. is that you know to modify your tools you never use something straight out of the box yeah everybody's hands are different you know the length of your arm way your arms move, the way your you know, upper body is set up, we naturally have different motions, um, even when we're doing some of the same things. So it makes sense that you know, your, your knife blade or your tool would have a slightly different curve or a different shape in order to you know, best capture your natural movement. Because you don't want to you know, do the same thing over and over again with a tool that doesn't work for you. You're just going to wear your joints out. You're going to wear your eyes out. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what this is all about is working with your hands. So it's making the tools work for you. At, yeah. At that level. Yeah. Efficiency and ergonomics. And mm -hmm. yeah. Um, not that we have an example here. I, I didn't ask you to bring one down, but can you just tell our audience what you are working on at your stage in bookbinding in the bookbinding program right now? Yeah. Um, actually upstairs right now, I, I have a, a piece of leather paired. We're working on um, a rounded spine leather clamshell box. So, um, clamshell box, two sides, they sort of come together and enclose a book mm -hmm. or, you know, set of objects completely. Um, oftentimes they just have a flat edge. It's sort of very practical. Um, this is the more sort of deluxe version of that. We take a, a piece of uh, basswood, smooth it out, get a very nice gradual curve over it so that it sort of resembles the spine of a book on a shelf. We put false bands on it and then we cover it with leather and sort of again make it make it resemble sort of a deluxe book on a shelf we'll put tooling on it um we are well hopefully either tomorrow or the next day um you know barring weather uh, we'll get an announcement about our set book which mm -hmm. is sort of our um in the the last semester of the program the two-year program here we have a set book that we get in sheets and it's uh, a fine binding from start to finish, you know, mm -hmm. do the folding, do the sewing, do all the forwarding, and then you do a design binding at the end. And that's sort of our culminating project uh, for yeah. this program. So that's always such a fun project. You see all of the personalities come out in their work um, because they're all doing the same text block. The text block, is that what it's called? Correct. Yeah. And, but they can embellish and use all of the techniques that they've learned throughout the program. And it's just this rainbow of um, design. Mm -hmm. I love that project. And we have, we actually just got some documentation on it. He hasn't told us the title um, yet of what we're working on. Generally, it's a, you know, once we know that's kind of all we think about is like, how are we going to design this? Um, so he specifically waits until, you know, right before break when we'll have some time to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. But we did get some documentation about design and the way that we're going to approach this. And it's very much, you know, some people are coming here from prior careers. Some people are coming to North Bennett Street School from art programs. Um, 
So he made a point of telling us like, this is a, this is a craft based project. So even though it's a design binding, um, it's very much going to be based on your command of, of the, the technical skills. Um, of the all, all of the technical skills that you've learned in the program? More or less, yeah. yeah. Um, the rounding and backing, making sure that things line up the way they should. And it's less about, you know, you, you're, you're naturally going to put your own artistic spin on things, but people who, you know, maybe have a, a four-year degree in art mm -hmm. are, are on the same plane as somebody who has just come here from a construction degree, mm -hmm. um, because it's very much, do you make the book work technically? And then, you know, anything else that you embellish is, is, is your own. Right. That's great. Yeah. Um, in the last two minutes we have with Mitch, um, I'll share that he was also, Mitch was also one of our earliest in the making conversations. And you can go back in to our website uh, to the, to the in the making page and hear a conversation that I had with, with Mitch early on when we closed due to the global pandemic. And he shared with us his uh, paper making that he does um, the little balls of paper that are ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. so you can go and visit him there. And last thing in this last minute, all of our bookbinding tools are pretty much behind you on these shelves. What's in those two sections, <laughs> what's the most used tool that you need to have as a bookbinder? Oh, a bone folder, for sure. Yeah. So you yeah. need a folder. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, there's... Uh, there's a, Jeff Peachy actually has a great blog about the, you know, five essential tools, um, and he sort of surveys binders and asks them what they use. And it's, it's great to get different people's takes, but always a bone folder, mm -hmm. you know, the very, the very basic building block is a folded sheet of paper and you, you need to be able to get a crisp, um, straight fold out of that. And it goes from there. So. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks for sharing your Delrin folders. You. If anyone wants to purchase these, they can find them on our online store and um, he will ship them to you. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Of course. All right. I'm going to close this one. Let me put my headphones on. There is just so much tech happening right now. <laughs> Hi. Oh, there's Martha. Hi, Mitch. Hi, Martha. Hi, Martha. How are you? I'm doing Thanks. well. How are you? Oh, I'm well. Um, let me I need to leave this. There we go. Welcome. Thank you. Everyone who's, who's joining us right now, this is Martha Kearsley. She is a um, bookbinding graduate and an instructor here at North Bennett Street School. And she's joining us from Portland, Maine, or are you on, or are you on Peaks Island right now? No, I'm in Portland. I'm in, I'm in town. Peaks is right. part of Portland, but I'm technically on the peninsula. So. Right. So um, she's in strong, her, her bindery, strong arm bindery in Portland, Maine. Um, tell us what you're doing. Well, uh, these days I am doing a lot of repair work, but I'm also beefing up my stationary um, line of stationary that I've been developing for the last couple of years. Um, so right now, mostly working for clients on their collections, um, and then when the when when I have time to get in town, I'm here working on the press, um, putting together a couple of pieces that I've been working on for a while. Before you show us the things that you're working on, um, I have some of them here. There's some of the thing, the same things that you have behind you. Um, we sell Martha's one month letterpress calendar, which was is just really sweet. It's so darling. I love this thing. <laughs> it's only one month. That's all we can handle, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, and it's it's um it's it's actually very fun to make. It's a very simple structure, but a really durable one. Mm -hmm. um, it's called a, a drum leaf binding, and so it's it's four individual weeks, weekly spans, um, and then those are all adhered very lightly, but but uh, carefully, so that it kind of works, opens really flat and is easy to write on and easy to read. Mm -hmm. We also carry some of your cards, which are, this is, this is just a top hit here. I can't keep these <laughs> stocked. So yeah. everyone, may your day be great. A little, a little Hellman's jar in there. 
Yes. Yeah, I work primarily from the collection of type that I have, um, as well as the ornaments and the, and the borders. I do some of my own carving and, and design work, um, but I've got a pretty substantial collection of type. So it's, it's an endless supply of um, inspiration for various things. And one of them was a little tiny Hellman's jar that was from some advertising. Uh, so you just said you sometimes will carve your own, yeah. what are you carving them out of? Uh, generally linoleum, um, some, some wood panel, some, some just uh, straight up plywood, um, mm -hmm. usually a birch veneer uh, plywood and um, print from those. Um, yeah, I saw you were holding up the, uh, there's a sailboat card. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that is linoleum block. And these are right here, the actual blocks that I print those from. So this, these are, this is one that you carved yourself. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one that I designed and carved myself. It's beautiful. It's so simple. Thank you. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I wanted it to look like some illustration from one of my textbooks when I was, you know, in grade school. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to bring this one back up to zoom into the um, Hellman's Mayo. It's just <laughs> adorable. Um, so talk to us about this big, huge machine behind you. Oh yeah, uh, this is, um, can you see that a little better? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a, it's a Vander Cook Universal One. It's um, a, a proof press, uh, which meant that it was used primarily by newspapers or larger publishing houses um, to actually proof their type. So they would set the type, put it up in a galley, run it on here, um, and literally just be spell checking, just be looking and, and proofreading. Um, and then once it was corrected, it would be put back in the galley and then sent over to a machine that was a little bit more, um, it, was a, it was a higher output, that it was a faster machine and could just do, you know, actually print run. Um, these are great machines for a number of reasons, but primarily because they are a cylinder press. Um, and I'm gonna, at the risk of making everybody dizzy, give you a little tour here. No, so good. there's a cylinder here. Um, and that is where the ink is distributed. And then the type is all placed down in the bed of the, the, of the machine. The cylinder runs over it, distributes the type on top and comes back. Behind that, there is the actual cylinder itself that the, the paper is mounted onto. Um, so that carries it down and brings it back um, and does the printing for you but it's a very powerful machine and the size of it is also really convenient for doing broadsides um, and larger work, so. Mm -hmm. Which we also sell one of your broadsides in here. Which one's that? Hold on. <laughs> so, thank you. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, folks. That was, that was stress your gut. And that was, yeah, that was, I was telling myself that and figured I'd tell, share it with others. No, it's great. You can buy this at, um, on our store online as well. So are you going to show us, are you going to run a print for us today? I print for you. I'm, I'm actually proofing something. I'm, I'm putting together a new year's card, um, or something for, for possibly a new year's card. Um, I set the type a while ago. And it was down here, um, the, my computer is right on top of a, uh, a furniture, a piece of furniture that holds trays of type, holds galleys. And so as I'm talking to you, I can just kind of pull out um, things that I might be printing repeatedly. So this is something that gets printed onto the back of, of packaging. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's something I'm gonna use maybe you know two months from now, I need to make more, more boxes. So I can just pull that out. So the type is all set. And this morning I just came in, pulled it out, put it on down in the press. Um, there is, again, I'm sorry for making anybody dizzy. Um, all that wood that you see are, are pieces of furniture that um, you lock up around the type. And that holds everything in place and nothing should move while you're doing this. So do you, do you find the right pieces to fit so that it's perfectly tight? Yep. It's, a, it's a system of, of pikas and lines and it's, it all sort of met, 
fits in with each other. It's a, it's a really elegant, um, kind of an elegant technology. It's, it's, it's all kind of ready-made. And at first you, you might be sort of overwhelmed by the, the numbers and trying to make sure things add up and that they, they fit in, but you get at it long enough and everything just makes sense. It just kind of like, oh, okay, you look at something, you know how much you need and you can go over it and the perfect size piece of furniture is right there. So mm -hmm. um, that all gets locked up. And uh, I do think, yeah, I've got, I've got the machine inked up. So I will just run a proof. Cool. And I think you'll, you'll probably just see me walking in front of it. Oh, sure. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So the, the first thing I'm gonna do, um, the first thing I'm gonna do is just run the ink across it. And that's called a trip. And then when it comes back, I'll actually put the paper in and that will be the run. So a little explanatory note there. So there's that. Oh. Little Happy New Year it says Happy New Year. And there's a couple of Puti who are kind of shrugging. They're not sure it's going to be a Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. Well, we'll know shortly, but. We'll, we'll know. I think it yeah. is going to be a Happy New Year. I think it's going to be a Happy New Year. Yeah, I'm an optimistic person. Yes. Yeah. That's so cool. I have, um, I have a few more questions for you. We're, we have about five minutes left. Sure. Um, so one, well, for, for those who are visiting us right now as guests, um, Martha is an instructor in the bookbinding program here. And if you weren't here for Monday's program, we, we did a tour through bookbinding. So you can go back and watch that on our YouTube channel and see Martha talk about cons teaching conservation to um, the first year students, which is what she was doing the other day. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of her specialty here at North Bennett. And so my question for you is, which, what do you spend more time and focus on conservation or this, this letterpress printing business? That's, a, that's, that's an ever evolving um, situation and it's evolving in the direction I want it to, which is pretty much a split right down the middle uh, between doing repair work. And, and part of that has been the, the, the circumstances this year. Um, I, I built out a bench at my home um, and suddenly found that I was much more productive in terms of being able to kind of compartmentalize. And so I do a lot of the repair work there um, and I can do it any time of day and then uh, come in and do the stationary work or do any kind of uh, cutting down for box making or all my heavy equipment is in town. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty much 50-50 at this point. And that's, that's where I want it to be for the next while. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you, you, you come in to, you commute. It's quite, quite the trip to see you walk in the doors because I know that you just came from Maine, which is just <laughs> wild. Um, and you, you come in and teach how many days a week? One day a week. It's basically about five days a month. So there's an extra day of um, either uh, coming in to do a, uh, and in, in normal circumstances, I would be working two days, consecutive days and staying in Boston um, or working three consecutive days and then coming back down two weeks later to do two days. Mm -hmm. um, under the present circumstances, I'm there one day a week and then I have office hours up here the next day so that if there's any follow-up questions, we can do that online. Mm -hmm. um, and then can you can you show us um, closer to the camera some of those letterpress objects that I'm seeing behind you? Oh sure. Is, um, is that a full calendar? This is a full calendar. Yeah, this is something um, I developed around the same time that I was doing the um, the, the one month calendars, and this is a six week uh, blank do it DIY or as I like to say you decide what day it is um, <laughs> calendar. every I mean that's pretty tricky that's a slippery slope it is <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm making these and padding them into a, a sets of 12 
That's um, beautiful. So you can just kind of tear them off and then it works. You know, you put one on your fridge and then one goes in your, your suitcase and goes with you. Um, I love that. Yeah, and this is this is printed the same way as I did the uh, the one month calendars, where it's mm -hmm. on photopolymer plates, and there's two plates. One has the, the the lines, the sort of the framing, and then the other plate has um, the fills. So I can really monkey around with color, which is which is oh, the for me. yeah. So that's something that I don't know if people can our guests can see. This is two color. Yeah. So there's a frame and a fill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very subtle, but in person, it's not, it's, it's just beautiful. <laughs> and this is so very Martha, these tones, these, these are Martha tones. Those are Martha colors. I, I, I don't own them, but I, I like to use them. No, they're just pure joy, which is what you are. Oh, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going to, um, bring in Zala now okay. um, but thank you so much for being with us Martha. Thank you for having me Kristen really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah okay. thank you and um, I'll see you in January. Yes and good luck with the weather I hope I hope it's not too horrible. Yep you too. Okay take care. Okay thank you. Bye. Bye. So next we have Zala coming in I'm gonna um, I'm gonna grab her chair while we're waiting for her to show up. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Hello, my friend. Hi, Kristen. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, I'm, I'm just trying to situate this so that everyone can see this chair. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the noise. Mm -hmm. This is Zala. Um, Zala is a graduate of our cabinet and furniture making program. She, you just graduated in, um, was it 2019? Yeah, 2019 May. Yes, May, yep. And um, right now you're in Vancouver? Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and I, I don't I don't have this um, up on the online store, but we're just going to talk about it. And it is for sale, and it's here in the store. Um, so if you're interested, just email me at store at nbss.edu. But we're going to talk to Zala about this a little bit. Um, I remember it was one of the last pieces that... Yeah, it's, it was the last piece I made at uh, uh, North Bennett. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it was quite a rush. I finished it within, I think, six to seven weeks, which is really fast for a chair. Um, and why did you choose? I remember talking to you about this in person. You, This is the only one of sort of this style that I've seen in a long time here. So what, what was it about the style that you chose? Um, it was, uh, I think it was French Art Nouveau. And uh, uh, it was actually a replica um, I saw on the book. And um, um, it was made by a, a French person uh, in 1936, I think. And um, um, so I saw this very beautiful picture of the rendering of a, of a chair. And then I, I was telling Lance, I, I wanted to make my chair like that for my second chair. So yeah, he, he helped, me, helped me making this chair every way possible. Mm -hmm. and there there it is yeah and we have some more of your objects um here in the building because you when you left you went straight to um las vegas is that correct? Uh, yes yes i went on a um on for a competition in la las vegas um for uh it was for uh students graduated within two years and we could submit our work to that competition and i finally got into the finalists, uh, one of the few, and uh, uh, we had a ceremony and then uh, we selected um, first, second places and best of show uh, from these finalists. I got um, first place for my um, for my music set for, uh, for the open category and uh, uh, second place for my uh, little um, walnut Mm. Amber cabinet. The jewelry the box. 
yeah for the for the um uh, cabinet category one of my most favorite pieces i've ever seen <laughs> i love yeah. that piece thank you um, something to note about Zala is um, that what we can tie into this winning awards in Las Vegas, um, you, somebody noticed you there from the um, Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine and yes. said you need to come to our school. And so Zala had that on her schedule. And then the pandemic hit worldwide and the borders closed and she didn't get to go to fulfill that program there. And Absolutely, so, yes. Yeah. So it's still in the works, um, but for now, it's you're you're kind of in limbo. What's that? Kind of. Oh, <laughs> oh Rob, Rob just popped in. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> um, but something you're filling your time with also is um, teaching yourself graphic design, which you know is awesome. That's something you need to know. Yeah, exactly. I I find that it, even if. I don't change my occupation to graphic designer later on. I can still make it useful for my for my uh, uh, furniture making. But I, I am um, kind of suiting myself in this pandemic so that while I cannot see anyone in my house, I can still um, connect with people on the internet um, and maybe change my occupation to a um, to a, a new one like graphic design designer so that I, I'm not so out of the society and uh, still take works and still make money mm -hmm. because I, I can I cannot set up I cannot really set up a shop in Vancouver right now it's um it's my parents house and, and not staying here a long time just avoiding COVID so um and this kind of no point I'm still going back to Toronto uh, which which is on the um east coast of Canada and now I'm in the west coast so it's kind of really long distance uh, we have to drive five, five days to go back there mm. so it's a uh, little no point to uh, set up a shop over here or um, like COVID is still bad over here so it's a uh, kind of no reason to go outside and rent a shop. Mm -hmm. um, um, something about Zala's background that she was doing in um, uh, Toronto is film, um, building film sets, being a, yes, a, a carpenter, a carpenter on, on the set, yes. Right. Um, and then something else that we talked about recently is um, that I want to just talk to our audience about is that you, you, you know, sort of being in limbo, you are not only teaching yourself a new craft in graphic design, but you're also recognizing the need to just sit still and maybe not do anything for a moment. And yeah, that's really like, valuable. Like what we talked about it, um, I, I'm kind of accepting myself uh, of my state um, uh, about how, um, how I'm not worried about uh, getting money so, um, like I used to get, um, like how how I uh, rush myself to work um, on the set while there's still COVID going on. Um, I kind of, I guess I value my health um, more than money. <laughs> so, um, so I guess um, I'm kind of accepting myself staying at home, uh, teaching myself new crafts, um, and um, and just being here not to worry about the future right now mm -hmm. because it, it will get better, I'm, I'm sure of it. And it is getting better. Um, so I think when it gets better, um, I will definitely go back to um, furniture making and my um, old usual daily routines and uh, um, just carry on from there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, I told you this recently, and I might be way off base, and I don't want to project my own dreams for you. But um, I'm, I would, it's, I think it's a sure bet that you'll be doing something creative, whatever it's going to be. Um, you know, hopefully, you'll go into the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship in Maine when that's now when once it's safe to do so. Um, but yeah. even if you don't, you're going to be doing something creative. I know it. <laughs> I hope I go there again too. Um, I, I emailed uh, the director over there, Peter Korn, who recognized me at um, at um, at Vegas, 
um, I, I told him that I, I cannot go right now and uh, um, I, I hope to apply again. Um, and he understands. Mm -hmm. So, so well, I, I guess I, I can, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, he understands that as, as I think we all do that the furniture world or woodworking world needs somebody with your aesthetic and eye and talent. I would Thank say you. that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hope I can make more work um, in the future, and I, I definitely will make more work. And uh, I have lots of ideas in my mind right now. I just cannot make it in the wood. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to uh, render them maybe through graphic design and uh, um, and through sketches, so that um, I can make it more smoothly when I when I project them in wood. So. Um, mm -hmm. So my idea will still be there and will not be dead. Yeah. And we, t we joked about um, you, uh, Lance Patterson, we met who was one of Zala's instructors is, um, he's a graduate from 1978 from North Bennett and now he's an instructor. And we met him yesterday in the cabinet furniture making tour. And um, uh, Zala offered to send him a bunch of masks when the pandemic hit because everybody would like to keep everybody safe but Lance everybody wants to really keep Lance safe so I gave <laughs> yeah. Zala the challenge to build us a Lance shaped bubble so let's see if that takes off <laughs> I, I, I was thinking about it too yeah I'm sure you were <laughs> I'm I'm still in uh in the process of making that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can make something out of it. <laughs> oh yes, you will. Um, but anyway, so I'm just gonna go back to this beautiful chair so that it's the only thing that I have up here in the store of yours. The other items are sort of tucked away. Um, but I just think everybody should seize all his work and and um follow you, you know, in your next journey. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're getting up to the top of the hour and I think we're going to jump um, up to the jewelry making program if Rob's hopping in. Um, but while we're waiting, oh, there he is. Hey, I'm listening. Oh, cool. Great to see you, Zala. Great to see you, Rob. Not time to yeah. see you. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And I think, <laughs> did you just mention the masks from Shin Wu? No. Oh nope. no, is another mask project? We were talking about masks that, that Zala wanted to ship to, to Lance and um and he declined. So oh, funny. <laughs> Twice. Funny. Yeah. So Twice. I, I'm wearing a mask that Shin Wu shipped uh here from Taiwan. And oh. uh, I referenced that when we opened the day, and I just thought it's such a nice and thoughtful thing uh for somebody to do. Um and uh and so I figured I I'd sport it and it's uh medical grade and uh, it's much easier to breathe through and to talk with, so. Mm, great. Oh, nice. Okay, Zala, I'm gonna say goodbye and thank you so much for popping in to our open house. I, I, it's great no seeing problem. you. It's a good pleasure to, to talk with you guys again. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk to great you. Great to see you, Zala. And, and I'm gonna depart the store and I'm gonna hop up to jewelry and meet Rob. That's great, we'll see you in a minute. Okay, thanks everybody. I'll be right cool. up. <clears throat> hey everybody, uh, great to see you again. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, attending our first virtual open house. Uh, we've had these live tours of all nine full-time programs uh, and we're uh, we're about to wrap up this entire event uh, by visiting Jewelry Making and Repair. Uh, it is a 18 month uh, program. It has starts in September uh, and in February, uh, usually every year. Uh, and uh, we have a February start coming up. So one of the entire reasons we're even uh, hosting this open house uh, is to showcase what happens here so that uh, it resonates with you, or the people in our audience, and that you can see how accessible uh, North Penn Street School is. Uh, and you know, if you if you are thinking of coming here uh, to build on a career you already have, uh, to redirect into a new career, um, we encourage you to to do that. You can inquire 
if you're ready, you can uh, start that application process. Uh, my colleague Sharon is uh, staffing the, the chat function uh, here, so you can ask questions uh, about admissions to her. You can visit our excellent website. Uh, we have our marketing communications uh, crew is uh, they're, they're staffing the, the Zoom controls here. Uh, and that's Kevin Derrick and Barbara Rutkowski. Uh, we will uh, have all of this available uh, for you to see on YouTube after this. So you can, if you didn't, uh, if, if you wanna share this with people that didn't have a chance to see, uh, they can go back and see that. And um, I love this sign behind us. Uh, Anne brought this in uh, right, I think around the time that uh, we were all impacted by the pandemic, but together uh, we'll see it through. And uh, that is holding true here at North Bennett Street School. Uh, without further ado, I am gonna switch the view of my camera and introduce you to uh, Ann Cahoon. Hey Ann, how are you? Hey Rob, hey everyone. Welcome to Jewelry Making and Repair. <sighs> That's great. So I love to start every tour of the shop here at the front, at the cases. Um, so everything in these cases uh, are examples of current student work and work that's in the curriculum and it starts to really tell the story of what we do and how we do it so as rob mentioned we are an 18-month program um, and every student goes through the same process of projects there are just over 50 individual projects in the curriculum so we start down at the bottom here with really basic sawing and filing exercises. Then we start to move into more complex fabrication. Um, we're starting to solder. And then in the first semester, students are already setting their first stone. So we're starting with cabochon stone setting. If we come to the case over here, we get a little deeper into some of our more complex projects and our faceted stone setting. So students start setting faceted stones in their second semester. It's the reason a lot of students come to our program. At that point, we're also working on more complicated projects with hinges. We're working in gold. We're working in platinum. So every student will work in all of the precious metals. So silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. Um, one of the real benefits of the way we do things here is we have a precious metals library. So even as precious metals markets are crazy, which they are right now, every student has access to all of the So we had to change the way we do things this year. Um, historically, students would gather around the bench with absolutely no respect for personal space, which was great, and we'd work one-on-one -on -one hands-on. Of course, now we need to maintain social distance, so the bench or benches are captured here on screen. And it's been actually a really, really great transition, and we're really enjoying exploring the technology. Other technology that lives up front here is our laser welder. So our uh, laser welding is a part of the curriculum. We focus on it mostly for repair work. Um, so you can start using this tool right around the second semester for tapping, and then quickly move into repair. The wall behind me is our, our wall of fame. So these are all examples, with one exception, of techniques that we teach here in the full-time program. This is all work of alumni. So everything on this wall is rooted in skills that are here in the full program. Hi, Anne. Hey, good to see you. Welcome. Welcome on your tour. Yeah, welcome on in. So this is um this is a, our sink area. I know it doesn't seem very exciting, but there's some really important basic cleaning tools here that you're going to learn a little bit about in our demos. Ultrasonic pickle, which is a hot acid, and a steamer, as well as some mass finishing equipment. This is called a rigorous really, 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 excuse me, a magnetic pin finish. Then we come into our hot work area. So this is our core area where we do all of our soldering and all of our welding. Uh, we have four stations here right now. Well, we have multiple stations, but we can accommodate as many as four students in this space right now um, with appropriate uh, partitions as we need them. Um, we run, for people who are curious, natural gas on a booster and bottled oxygen. 
Y'all missed changing the cylinder this morning, but we just changed out this thing today to make sure that we didn't run out during the demo. Nice. That would be embarrassing. <laughs> That's okay. We, we could, we're problem solvers. Back here, we have some more esoteric equipment. This is called a draw bench. Everyone always loves this. It looks like a torture device. It does. It looks medieval. <laughs> so what this is actually used for is making wire. So uh, our second project in the curriculum is to pack the chain, and students make all of their stock for that chain. So we start with really large gauge wire, and then you use this piece of equipment to draw it down into sm smaller uh, gauge, find the wire, for students to fabricate their first chain. That's also the first project that students repair. So we do chain repair at the same time we do chain fabrication. Coming on back here, we have our large porch area and our ventilation hood, as well as all of our casting supplies. So that's going to be our wax pot, our vulcanizer, any canned wax part and stuff lives in here. Come so back here, this is a more active area of the shop. This is our forming and polishing area. So we have multiple pieces of equipment here that we use for polishing everything from- That was me. <laughs> <laughs> not mind the man behind the curtain. Everything from uh, grinders, sandblaster, to uh, what is more traditional in the jewelry industry, which are polishing motors. This, this is outstanding. <laughs> <laughs> that is part of our forming equipment. So these are all examples, they're in terrible shape. Um, but these are all examples of uh, tools used in raising. So um, one of the things a lot of folks don't know is that there's a difference between silversmithing and goldsmithing. And it's not the materials that you work with, it's actually the techniques. So these are all examples of silversmithing tools. And the way they work, so we have this, we have this, they work hand in glove with our angel. So we don't use the anvil for as much big forming, um, but it's a really, really important piece of equipment in the shop. And this is, I will also go on record saying, probably the prettiest anvil we've ever seen. We take really good care it's of our I anvil. agree. You don't usually see surfaces. <laughs> so, but if you touch it, it gets greasy. So everyone knows that. Oh, no, that's, that's, why the that's why the sandpaper's there. Um, so not very exciting. Lots and lots and lots of stuff. Jewelry making requires. Lots of stuff doesn't look very interesting, but all of these containers are polishing compounds. So one of the things we try to make sure is that our students have a really comprehensive understanding of all of the particulars from more modern solutions to more traditional solutions. And then behind me is yet another polishing station. So this is for use with a flexible shaft, and we'll be talking more about that in one of our demos. It's quiet in here now which is a little unusual. <laughs> Normally right. there's lots of dust collection running and things of that nature. So all of the equipment in this room in particular is equipped with dust collection for both safety and for um, metal reclamation reasons. Cool, thank you, Anne. Absolutely. So we can walk through the student benches and see where everyone is at and what they're up to. And then we'll join Joanna up front. She's gonna teach us a little bit about the campus. So these are our student areas. Everyone has their own bench. These are examples of, these are actually all student benches. These are folks who just wrapped up their 2020 graduation requirements. So they're gonna have some slightly more advanced equipment like a microscope and bench top dust collection. Wow. Over here. Quietly. I swear, they're not on their best behavior. It's always like this. <laughs> so, Jill and Evan are actually working on the same project right now. They're working on a cylinder class. Hey, Evan. Mechanical class. It's hey, the last and most complicated yeah. fabrication project in the curriculum. Can we get close? Absolutely. Okay yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I can action it for you. So, the click is the best part. Yes. Mm -hmm. So satisfying to finally get it. And when you want to open it, you just Press down on that. Open back up. Nice. Mm -hmm. what, <laughs> what is the name of that class? A cylinder class. Cylinder class. Um, and then we make a fine silver chain as well that we're going to attach this to eventually and make a bracelet. Mm -hmm. What makes the difference between fine silver and sterling silver? Uh, the alloy. So uh, sterling silver is alloyed with copper and zinc. Um, 
it's 92.5% silver and then 7.5% other stuff, um, whereas fine silver is um, as close to 100% silver as you can get. So it's usually labeled as 99.9%. Um, so and it needs just a little bit of something because it's so just soft. Just in case, I think. <laughs> so uh, no, actually, a little bit of something is um, it's frankly it's cover your trousers. Um, so they can't guarantee that it's truly chemically pure. So ah. it's pure out to the third decimal place. So 99.9% percent .9 pure. Very it's good. Probably more pure than that, but they can't guarantee it further than that. Nice. Can, can I just um, announce something? Um, we sell on the on the online store. Here I am back again at the online store. Um, we, sell, <laughs> we sell earrings that um, the jewelry making program has made, and they're challenge earrings. And ninety percent of the sales of those um, come back into the jewelry making program. And we have a pair up now that Jill made that are super radical. Oh, that's great! <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Jill and Evan are examples of one of our pods this year. So we are we are not technically a pod-based program, but we are broken into smaller groups this year to make sure that everyone has plenty of space um, to keep everyone as safe as possible. So Kaylee and Zachary. Hey Kaylee. Uh, I'm be showing you some hey Zachary. Stone setting in a little while, and they're both working on stone setting right now. Kaylee's working on her first silver flush setting project. Creative layout. So a big piece of flush setting is actually putting all those holes where they belong. It's harder than you might think. And so flush setting is uh, one of the things that we do. It's an important technique in and of itself. But it's one of the things we do in preparation for bezel setting as well as bead and pave setting. Cool. And just to remind everybody who's just joined us, we have a, a live audience. And, uh, and I know that a lot of graduates also uh, are live. I just got a message from my colleague, Sharon, that she said there's some graduates that are watching. So if everybody wants to say hello. Hey, everyone. I don't know who's there, but thanks for joining us. <laughs> cool. So exactly. He's working on his first basket heads. And we're actually going to be exploring basket heads as we talk about faceted stone setting in just a little while here. So that is a tea post, which is an example of a finding, and a cast basket head. Thank you, Zachary. So if we head up to the front of the house, I think Joanna is ready for us and she's gonna talk to us a little bit about one of the most important building blocks of any jewelry program and that is handrails. Cool. So I'm gonna come around the screen and, hi, how are you? Good, great to see you. Um, so I'm Joanna. I'm a first semester student here in the jewelry department at North Bennett. Um, and like Anne said, I'm going to be talking to you about band rings, which are really kind of like a building block for us. Um, so band rings are pretty self-explanatory. They're a band of metal that you turn into a circle and you wear as a ring. So, and they can really be as simple or as jazzed up as you want them to be. Um, for the purposes of today, we're just making a standard simple band ring. Um, and like we said, they're very much um, a building block skill-wise and for future projects. Um, you can set a stone on these, you can etch them, you can do whatever you want, the sky's the limit. Um, and it also, like I said, it also teaches us the process of making it with the sawing, the cutting, the filing, forming, soldering, you name it, really. Um, so the process that we're using is fabrication, which is where you take the actual piece of metal and you form it directly into the object of your desire. Um, and the other thing I want to stress that this teaches us is the importance of accuracy in your work. And for the purpose of this, the accuracy that I really want to stress is, <laughs> is a ring size. So the difference between ring sizes is 2.54 millimeters. And that, that's a very, very small size, right? And I'll show you a real world example in a second, but to start thinking, we're working in very, very small dimensions. So accuracy and precision is kind of like the name of the game here. So today we are going to be making a size eight band ring. Uh, 14. Sorry, I'm dropping everything. 
This is um, 14 gauge half round sterling silver wire. So the first thing you want to do, obviously, you got your stock and you need to figure out how long it needs to be. So I, we have a handy dandy chart over here where you take your gauge, you drag it down to the size you want, which is a size eight. And we have a length of 61.6 .6 millimeters. I'm gonna take my calipers again, and we're gonna set it to 'll spend the whole hour watching me try to adjust these. <laughs> Those are the folks we're looking for. Oh my gosh. Oh, everybody's welcome and we're glad you're with us audience from wherever you are. tools that you get to play with in these programs. Oh, this one's real fun. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. In a maddening way? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's so precise, right? I can neither yeah. confirm nor deny. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to do 61.6 millimeters. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. 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 Let's And we make a little bit of line where where our 61.6 .6 millimeters is. Now, when it comes to cutting this piece out, what we want to do is we want to cut on the outside of that line. Because if we cut on that line, then we have to file and we can get too short. So let me show you a couple of examples here. So these are some pieces I cut out earlier. And this one is just about 61.6. Can't get this to work for me. Yeah, so this is 61.6. So this is a size eight ring. Now this one, I think that's my size. <laughs> oh, but it's your lucky day then. Uh, maybe. This one is a 60.93. So what happened here is I cut it to a size eight, but then I messed up and I had to file it. So now it's a quarter of a size too small. Um, and if you're trying to make this for a customer, like this isn't gonna fix, this isn't gonna fit your customer. You gotta start over. Um, and this piece, So this piece is 59.2. So that's a size seven. So these, this is the difference between sizes. That big one there, yeah. that's an eight. This small one's a seven. And the one in the middle is a seven point, um, seven and three quarters. So like I said, very small dimensions that we're working with here. Right. Um, and you can, let me tell you, you, you lose your length real quickly if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I love being right here because I, I think we can hear you best with my makeshift microphone uh, here. I also know there's a monitor behind you. So anytime you want to kick me out of your space here and, and send me back there, you just let me know. Oh, Joanna. no worries. You're getting like a full on shot of the shaking oh, good. hands and everything. So. <laughs> All right. Now, because I'm on camera, I can't cut anything straight. So that's a little bit on the wonky side, but that's okay. I've got just enough room that I can go ahead and file that flat. Good. And we appreciate you doing this. Uh, Should 
be about all it takes to get it to your side. So um, the next step for this, which I'm not going to show you, but I will tell you about it. Um, okay. We need to anneal the piece. So with metal, it's made up of all these little like atoms that when you're working with it, it kind of hardens them together. And when you anneal it, that's taking it up to a temperature where all of that can relax. So then it's easier to work with and it kind of just like bounces back to its normal state. So what we would do here is we would anneal this so it's kind of easier to work with so that then we can make sure that our piece is flat. Um, <laughs> See, this one isn't flat, it won't stand up. Um, so it's all flat so that we can then form it into our ring and have like a good square oh, situation good. going on. So I am going to put that one aside because it's not annealed and I am going to grab the one I did earlier. That's So this is my size eight, and we're going to start forming this. Now, when you when it comes to forming a ring on a mandrel, it's what we want to go for is kind of like a D shape, right? So this is an example of what we're going for. We've got a bit of a flat surface here so that our ends can meet, so that then later on we can solder it. But nothing is too too it's all curved so that we can then round it out more easily. Like we don't have any harsh angles here. So this is kind of what we're going for. Let me show you how it works. Sure, and I'm just, as I'm learning this, uh, listening oh, to you, yeah. I feel like you're, so you're making this come at a flat angle so that you can get it, get it to bond. Yes. And then once it sets, then you'll take it from that oval shape that mm -hmm. has that that kind of uh, 90 degree angle yes. uh, and then round it out. Yes, so you're gonna get a whole demo about that a little bit later on, but that's exactly right. So we need our ends to meet so that we can then solder it together and form it into one piece and then we can round it out into the completed ring. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that the stage of the rounding that I see on your bench yes. there? Do you want to take a look at that? I don't know if you can see Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. So this is kind of how the stages go. So you start with your flat piece, and then you start at the ends. And I'll show you this in real time. And you're just going down until you can get it to meet. And then you can work to the solder. Very cool. Thanks for pointing that out, Kristen. This might be the loud part, just to warn you. That's okay. And we're just starting at the ends. bit and we keep flipping it so that we're doing it all evenly. And I'm going to trust that I'm keeping it flat. And it's a little bit off right here, you see? It's going off a little bit, so I'm just going to take it. Flatten that out a little bit. Because if you can keep it flat and square in this process, it's easier as you move along, so you don't have to fix it later. Right, because you're looking for those ends to meet mm -hmm. to join them. Yes. And then I'm looking at the hammer that you're using. It looks like one side might be plastic and one yes. side might be like a, a brass or... Yes. Um, this is a brass and nylon mallet. Um, this is our nylon side. This is what I'm using um, because it's softer. Um, this is the brass side. Don't, <laughs> I have made the mistake before. I've picked up my mallet and I haven't looked at which end I'm holding. Sure. And I've hit the ring with this and it will deform it. Okay. Because this is softer than the brass. So we're using the soft side that won't mess up our piece. I have a fun fact. Um, locksmithing is 
they also use that hammer. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So I, I got to get down in the weeds here and correct you all. That's not a hammer. It is a, it's a, it's a mallet. mallet. You had it right. You said you knew it was a mallet. Well, well it's a thing that hits things. That's what I'm I, I, I knew the materials of each yeah. end. Do I still get a ring <laughs> at the end? And then we had a question from a member of our audience. Do you always work from the outside in? Um, um, yes, you do. Um, I, I don't, I'm going to let Ann answer sure. how it would go badly if you go from the inside out. Um, but yeah, we always form it this way, the way we're taught here. Cool. Do you go from the inside out ever on the ring? Nope. Well, I mean, you could, I guess. Nothing you could, but this is the best way to do it. This is the best way to do it. This is the best way to do it. What we're looking for here, what we're focusing on is contact in the solder seam mm -hmm. rather than the net shape. Shape comes later. So we have to get that solder seam along first. And Right. So shape comes later is what Ann said if you are not able to uh, hear. And um, what was the other thing you just said, Ann? Uh, You're working to connect the solder seam. Yeah, so solder, the soldering, the alignment of your solder seam is your, is your priority. So you can only get a certain, you can only get so far before you can't get it off your mandrel anymore. And at that point, you can start to put on your pliers. So you're done with your mallet. Now the pliers that I use, see that shape? So they're squared off on one end, but they're rounded on All this right. side so that we can hold our ring and we won't damage the inside. Nice. Yep. All right. So I'm going to put my pliers in closest with the pliers. And we're taking our pressure from the back. So we're always working, trying to go back. And that is a pretty respectable. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so it's it strikes me you're you're probably always working with the end in mind, right? Like yes. every step you take, yes. you're you're planning on what the ne that next thing to do is yeah. to to make something that that lasts ultimately. Exactly. One thing that Anne likes to tell us is that finishing begins with the marks that you don't make. Right. Um. So I'll throw myself under the bus. I've got like this ring that. I marked up the inside like so badly with my pliers. Uh -huh. So if I go in and I try to um, file all that out, like I'm going to be losing so much material here. Like it's going to be a much thinner ring. Right. And it's going to take forever as well. So um, the more gentle you can be with your piece, like the on everything, like the fewer marks you can make, the better setup you are for the end. Um, and like you said, we're thinking about the next steps. So this, once we solder it, this is going to be super easy to round out. And to round out on our mandrel and to become the circle. Very cool. Yeah. So Danny is actually ready to take us through Thank you, Joanna. the next steps. Thanks, Joanna. That was great, Joanna. Thank you. So we're going to put it over here. Snap solder. <laughs> And we're gonna connect with Danny. Hey Danny, how are you? Good. I think so. I'd, I'd have to ask the audience. Are people here? Just yell. Just yell. Oh, just yell. <laughs> All right, so what we're doing here is we're soldering the band ring that Joanna just formed. Not actually the one that she formed, but one like it. 
Um, the process in between the, uh, the initial forming and the soldering is that we need to clean it. It's really important to clean it because the solder, through capillary action, is going to kind of dissipate into the material. And if there's a speck of dust, if there's some chemical residue, it's just not going to adhere. So we would use something called the ultrasonic, which is sort of like in our shop is soapy water, kind of shifts your um, piece around, it agitates it, and then we would steam it. So it's really, really clean. And so that's what we have here. And if you're wondering what this crusty white stuff is, that's flux. Um, I've got it in a little container here. You just apply it with a little paintbrush. And that is because when we apply, you know, great heights of heat, uh, metal tends to oxidize and that can form this really thick black or gray kind of smoky layer. And we don't want that. Uh, we can take that off, but it's just a pain in the butt and why would you want that? So we put flux on to protect it. It also serves as an indicator of the temperature that you're working at. Because this is sterling silver, it will anneal for um, just anneal at a certain temperature and we want the flux as an indicator. So it turns sort of kind of glassy consistency. And that's when we know that it has annealed and we want to pull away and we want to quench it, which is this water um, here. After anything we do that heats the material, you want to quench it, usually, not in every case, um, to bring the temperature way down so you can handle it, examine what you've done. Um, so let's get into it. Before I actually show it, because it's so small, you're not really going to be able to see the, the solder. I um, drew out some pictures. Oh, cool. So first what we do um, is we cut out a little, this is the solder. Um, it's a very small sheet, it's very thin. This is silver solder, which has a little bit of zinc in it to change the melting temperature. And so then we place our little square after we flex it, the flex acts as sort of a, a temporary glue. And then we get it to the melting point. In this case, the melting point is 1370 for this solder. And melting is different from flowing, which is the final step, which is where it actually drops and dissipates through that capillary action. And then if you've done it correctly, if you're seeing as well aligned, uh, very clean and good, then you should have a connected solder seam. So in terms of what temperature to get to, this is our torch. There are different torch tip sizes. This is a number four which is um, kind of middle ground. There are smaller, there are larger. Um, and then there are these two lines. This is gas and this is oxygen. When you turn on the torch, you always turn on the gas first and then add the oxygen. The oxygen makes it more oxidizing um, and therefore hotter. So you use a different kind of flame for different things. This is a sort of medium sized piece of stock. So you don't want a crazy huge flame, but you don't want anything small because it'll take forever. So now that I've already flexed it, I've placed my solder, pallion, which in this case is a little on the bigger side, but I just, you know, if you want to be cautious, you might throw a little bit more in, but you also don't want to flood it. It's a delicate balance. Um, this is my pick, which I use to wet it, and then I place the pallion. These are my tweezers, which I want to have on hand. This is my striker, which is how I ignite the flame, which I will show you now and is often a very fickle process. Aha, there we go. Here's the flame. This would be way too small. So about, about here, you should be like five and six inches for something around this size. And we're using a charcoal block, uh, charcoal block because it create, uh, creates a reducing atmosphere and it smolders. So it kind of contains the heat. Um, everything here is heat or flame resistant. This tabletop, this um, pad of solderite and the charcoal they want to be as safe as possible always so we have our flame this right now is uh, a reducing flame because it has more gas than oxygen and then we just slowly start to nope that wasn't slow we add oxygen and as you can see it's getting bluer it's hotter it's um, got a lot more oxygen in it a true that's a that's an oxidizing flame a neutral flame would be uh, an equal amount of both oxygen and gas. And so here we want what is technically a reducing flame, but there is kind of a crap load of oxygen in it. And 
I don't know if you can see it on camera, but there's a blue cone, an inner blue cone, and at the very end, there's still a little wisp of orange. Um, and that's how you know it's still producing. And now that we are ready, I will begin. So we're gonna start in the back here um, to get the whole ring up to temperature. The flux can be a little bit, it's sort of delicate. You don't wanna overtax it. So you wanna get the whole piece because uh, silver is very conductive. So we're gonna start, actually I'll hold the pick. So you wanna start in the back. You really wanna keep moving. You wanna work at that point of the cone. And then once the, flat, uh, the flux turns glassy, then you wanna start moving it around. And I have the pick on hand in case this little tallying moves. But right now, luckily it's staying put. And that was it starting to melt. And then I'm getting it a little too hard. But soon it should flow. Done it right. And there we go. Okay. And then we punch it, turn off the gas and oxygen, oxygen first and then gas. And then, because I've punched it, it's cool. I can handle it, no problem. And it is technically a soldered seam. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's great. And yes, from there, I would, making sure that everything's off and safe, I would take it over to. So this is the ultrasonic I mentioned earlier, that's the steam, and this is the pickle. And it's a mix of acid and water, and it's essentially like a kind of a heavy duty cleaner, chemically, um, and also dust wise, you just want to get all that crap off before you move on to the next stage, which is sheeping, and I will show you at my bench. So this is my bench. It's um, not clean and it usually looks worse. So take my bench pin off because we're going to form. So this is not the same ring, but it's essentially the same shape, uh, a rough D, but this one has been previously soldered. And in the process, of soldering we anneal it which Joanna talked about so this is ready to go it's pretty soft and it should be formable if we are lucky and this is our ring mandrel I don't know if we saw earlier but there are our sizes and we are making the same size this is a size eight and okay I'm in luck again yes <laughs> you're getting a lot of rings out of this um I picked this blank particularly because it's really 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 not round and Hopefully, we can show a pretty dramatic transformation. So I would make sure it's really stable in my bench. And then I'm using the same mallet, which is the brass and nylon. It's a mallet. It's a mallet. <laughs> um, the brass provides a kind of a counterweight and you hold it in the base of your palm and kind of let it do the motion. You don't want to just kind of like go in on it. Right. Um, it, that just makes me think uh, that you're, you know, you're putting in a good chunk of time every day. And so even just the, the thought around the ergonomics of using the mallet, you know, letting the mallet do the work uh, is just wise over time. Absolutely. Because, um, you know, if you're doing something wrong, you can kind of feel it, the soreness, the aching. That might happen anyways, but it'll definitely be much more intense if you're doing things with more effort than they require. So... Fortunately, this is right at the end. It was a little hard in camps, but you would just start. And you don't want to work on any one spot too long. Because it will start to thin out. And like Joanna mentioned, uh, you really want to do everything possible not to alter the dimensions of the stock you're working with. 
I'm not doing a fantastic job, but it was pretty wonky to start. And like Dorian also talked about, you want to do the most amount of work first so you can do lots less later. Um, So you can see it's moving, you know, it started at about a size five. That's as far as I can get it. And now mm -hmm. we're already at like a six and a half. Um, this is a size eight ring. So if I were to do my job correctly, it would move down the mandrel all the way to the size eight. And while you're doing this, you also want to watch your seam. Because if you haven't soldered it correctly, if there was a gap that you didn't realize or if the solder didn't flow all the way through, it will crack <laughs> and that is a terrible feeling but it does happen and you have to cut through it and start over <laughs> um which we never want to do if we can help it and like i said you want to give it equal pressure but right now it's um if you can see it's pretty clearly on both sides still an oval um and as it gets closer to round we can hold it up to the light and see if it's light tight, which would be ideal. And while we're doing this, we also want to make sure that it's flat, which Joanna also mentioned. Um, so you can see there are little gaps of light because it's not flat. Um, the thing about forming uh, a ring is that it's a give and take. As you make it round, it'll inevitably come out of flat. As you make it flat, it'll inevitably come out of roundness, which is really frustrating. But um, eventually, as you just go back and forth and you have to be patient, um, you will end up with something that is both flat and round ish, as close as possible. Yeah, so I think frustrating, but also on the far end, because you put the work in, there's great satisfaction uh, once you get, get to that place of the shape that you want. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's not the project that we're talking about right now, but if you see here, I've got some jump rings and I, um, I'm making a bracelet. And those are essentially like really tiny versions of this. And obviously you don't really, you generally don't hit these with a mallet on a mandrel, but they do have to be around, they do have to be flat. And I did this 32 times and it was a nightmare, but it's, it's important. <laughs> um, so. Pain and gain. Exactly, it all translates, it's all skills that you'll use later on. Yes, this is um, not round, but it is rounder. And once we cut it to a satisfactory degree, we would move on to polishing. Oh, is this the, the wheel we saw earlier back here? Yeah. Yeah. Oops. So okay. this is the polishing area. There are a couple different ways, not a couple, there are many different ways to polish. So what's over here, which we will not be demoing because it's a little more intense and not really something you want to be talking through. Okay. So here is my stitch buff. It is six inches, uh, six inches in diameter and then 50 sheets of muslin. That's what the six by 50 is. And I write Tripoli on it because that is the compound that I'm using with this muslin. We don't cross contaminate. Um, so this would be the next step after I use emery paper on it to make it as mark free as I possibly could without you know uh, thinning it out. Then we go to Tripoli, which is a pre-polishing step. It's not quite polishing, but you will notice a difference. It's, um, it's a cutting compound. So, so this is what it looks like in this shop. It's a block, um, a soft block with cutting particles suspended in it. And we would put this wheel on, make sure it's nice and tight. That's on there pretty good. This would be for the inside, but I'll just show you a quick example of what this looks like. And we would turn the 
dust collection on because we always want to be in a well vented, uh, ventilated area because so many little particles are going to be flying everywhere. So here's what it looks like. Can you just hold the ring up to that? Yeah, you would hold the ring here. So the wheel the, the is spinning this way. And so you would kind of want to motion this way mm -hmm. to get the most friction out of the, the process that you can. Um, as you can see, it's moving very fast. This is all in the high setting, which is what you would generally use. And you know, you don't want to have any bracelets. You don't want to have anything on you that could be pulled into it. Right. That would be disastrous and very dangerous. Yeah. Um, um, so now we turn it off and you never turn your back on it. You watch it, make sure that it's going off, slowing down. And when it's done, we can go over to the real polishing station that we're going to be using. Great. That's great. Danny, you're such a person of action. <laughs> just like follow you around through these steps. I'm like, you just get things done. I just try to cram this. So great. I think we have another demo to go catch. Yeah. So, um, but Danny, that was awesome. Sure, no, of course. Thanks, Danny. Thank you very much. All right, so we're gonna head back to the teaching area. And Danny and Zachary are gonna tell us a little bit about Fast Stones and Fast Stone Diamond. Hey, Ooh, wow. 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 Um, so I wanted to start with uh, some language just so we're all speaking the same language. Uh, over here really shows a good uh, visual of it. Uh, the parts of the stone. Uh, the flat part will be the table around here is a crown. The center part is the girdle and the bottom is the pavilion and the tip is the culet. When we set it into our basket setting, our culet's gonna wanna fall 50% between the upper and lower gallery, which is these two wires and the table is gonna to wanna to sit flat. Um, I'm gonna start demoing and Zachary is gonna narrate for me. Okay, great. Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Zachary. Hey, Zachary. I'm a student here at North Street School in the jewelry making and repair department. Um, yeah, so we're gonna watch Kaylee um, take a head uh, and find symmetry in the head so the stone sits nicely in it and flat and symmetrical. Um, and then we're going to watch her cut seats, which she just showed you on the diagram over there. So I will do my best to narrate as she goes along and kind of hope that neither me or her break a stone in the process. So <laughs> it'll be fun. No pressure. So right now she's just going through and checking that, um, that each of the prongs of the head is the correct distance from kind of the center line of the head drawn down uh, and adjusting what you need to in order to gain that symmetry. So when you put the stone to rest on the top and see if it matches, um, you have the, the prongs at the correct distance from the center. Therefore supporting the seat, once you go to cut those seats, uh, supporting the stone symmetrically in the head. So when you look at it, it's not shifted in all funny directions. And these are what we're working on, um, our basket heads that are post earrings. Uh, the post is actually um, stabilized in, in, this, in this holding, this GRS uh, ring clamp. Um, and now she's going through and just filing the top so they're all flush as well. So again, so when you put the stone down to match it, you know that you have the correct height um, of each of the prongs. So when you cut these seats, uh, they're all going to be coming to rest on the prongs in the, in the same way, meaning each one down on the prongs at the correct height. And in order to do that, that you need to measure uh, the distance between the bottom of the girdle right there and coming just 120% above the table and crown. So that's what she's doing right now. And she's gonna do it with her dividers 
And then she's gonna mark lines on the prong so she knows exactly where to cut her seats. Do you sharpen the points of the dividers ever? Yeah, if they become dull enough, yeah. Yeah. Also, what was that material that she's using to hold the stone? Oh, the uh, red, the red stuff. Was it gum? <laughs> it was yeah, kind of wax. It was, it, was, uh, it was, yeah, it was that red. What's it called? Big red. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> out of her mouth. No, it's uh, it's wax. It's a form of wax. I think it's bees wax. It, it's actually it's a branded product. It's Kate Wolf's Wicked Sticky. Kate Wicked Wolf's Sticky. Wicked Sticky. Yes. For Massachusetts <laughs> residents only. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now she's coming in and cutting her seat. Uh, to use that, she's using a setting a setting burr, which is also depicted over here in this graft. Um, it's slightly smaller than the stone, meaning that when she comes in, she's cutting each prong individually uh, and she wants it to be small enough where it's not catching another prong in that process. There are times when you use a size on burr and cut all of them at the same time. That is not what we're doing here. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so with a rotary tool like this, uh, you know, getting it spinning fast and then cutting your seats. Uh, and sometimes it's going to catch on the side. If you go slower, if you move your hand a little bit, it happens to all of us. Um, just kind of part of the game. And I can see there's a question about career stuff uh, from our audience. And I'd say after this demonstration, if we uh, have some time, we'll, we'll talk to Ann about that. Uh, of course, as everybody should know, the uh, we are a career school uh, at the beginning and the end of the day, uh, and we're training for employment. Uh, I realize that your question is about uh, sort of the details and the uh, uh, the avenues of employment after here, and so I will I'll leave that to Anne when we get there. <laughs> and for the virtual audience, what she just said was the burr is kind of dull. So these cutting tools uh, dull out over time and they become a big nuisance when they're dull and you just continuously bang your head trying to get it to cut properly when it's not and refusing to just replace it. So Anne is replacing, giving uh, Kaylee another one so it will cut better. So when you're cutting I put it on it, it didn't work. Sorry, thank you though. Um, so when you're cutting these seats, um, you want them to come in 50%. So resting 50% of the prong width. Now uh, you kind of start off in like 30%, one cut to 30% with all of them, and then you take each one. And sometimes you're gonna to have to adjust depending on this girdle of the stone is not always perfect. You can imagine, you know, these are cut by hand too. So you have a big girdle on this side and a small girdle on this side. And so you have to adjust your seats to match the stone. So the table of the stone sits in line symmetrically and level with the upper gallery and lower gallery. That, that makes that makes a lot of sense uh, with precision and things that are handmade. And then left behind from cutting is something we call birds, which are just little pieces of metal kind of stuck to the edge that will prevent the stone from sitting uh, down in its seats. keep cutting but yeah. take some time we have one set aside that's um level and ready that that will show you how to set complete sure
So putting the stone in the same orientation um, every time is important because as I was saying, they are like uh, not consistently the same size. So if you put it in differently, it'll, the table won't be exactly level and it takes a long time. So that's why we sort of split the demo up like this. Sure, thank you, we appreciate it. As an aside, I just want to say I, I'm enjoying the animal theme as well. I saw on the back of Zach's vest is a cat, and then Danny has a, a, a squid painted on her visor there. So I'm not going to ask you any further, but it, we love everybody and all the animals. Sorry, I just had to adjust to Just going to go back to our, our class here. Um, and then this is live on YouTube as well. And, uh, and after today, there'll be a, there'll be a link where uh, anybody, if you're in the audience here or anybody here, if you want to share, share this with people, um, uh, that link will be available at uh, North Bennett Street School. So if you look, that has a, a stone in there with a level table exactly where it needs to be that the seats are cut just for that stone and he's getting ready to set it. So I'll take his needle nose pliers. On one side, he's supporting um, the prong while he holds the other one. Well, it kind of gives it a squeeze just to tack it in there. This is called tacking. He'll do that to all four. So it has its has its place. I don't know. Coming right up. I think I have some in the store. That's cool. <laughs> I can see. I don't know if the audience at home can see, but I'm also getting in the black of the background here. We can see the reflection of uh, of everybody in this oh, room. Geez. It's kind of cool. <laughs> Let's make this work. <laughs> so this is a prong pusher. It has a channel cut out of it. It's like a flat. Um, yeah, the channel cut out is in the shape of a prong. We're just going to use that to fold the prong over onto the stone. Cool. How difficult is that? I mean, how much pressure does that take? Not much or a ton? It depends on the alloy. Um, Silver is pretty easy to maneuver. Um, white gold being probably the hardest. Um, yeah, I'm a really hard pusher, so <laughs> 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 pretend like everything is white gold. <laughs> One of the cool things about teaching people to set, everyone's different. There's always a student who pushes too hard and breaks everything, Kaylee. <laughs> 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 and then there's students who struggle, struggle with the hand strength, and they just can't make the material move. And by the time they're done with the pressure, they figured it out, and they go to moderate their pressure, or they make their hands stronger. So he's going to keep pushing until uh, the prong goes over 50% of the crown, so that, uh, so, yeah, the, the crown, if you remember what it is. Yeah. <laughs> And then uh, this, the name of this uh, eye tool here, the mon magnifying monocle. What <laughs> help help me out? I like that. Yes. The loop, the loop. I, I notice there's a lot of magnification in here because you're working at such a high level of detail. Um, it's it's pretty cool. I um, everybody on their visor has some magnification. Uh, then there's the loop. And then there are microscopes, so it's a progression. Our first semester students all use loops and optimizers, and as we move further on in the program, um, students start to use microscopes. Their first exposure to microscopes is at the laser welder, and then at their benches for stone setting when they get into fancy shapes. Nice. So now Zach is just filing down the prongs um, so they're even, and we're going to take them to very uh, 
specific heights up the rest of the stone. Like I said, uh, the, it's gonna be, the prongs themselves are on, like contacting the stone 50% up the crown. Right. And then the tips of the prong, which go a little bit higher, will be about 75 to 80%. And that's really to protect the stone in a way. So it doesn't get scratched and so it doesn't fall out. So it doesn't fall out, yeah. So why leave the prongs so long for setting? Why not just make them short? Because you must have cleaned up enough. Huh. Leverage, right? Longer prongs give us more leverage, makes it easier to lever them down on the crown. Mm -hmm. So it makes cleanup harder, but setting easier. And could it also be a little bit more secure? Well, um, we removed the material. So I see. that 50% up the crown and that 75% up the crown, we, those, those are about protection and, and longevity as well as security. So one of the things that we think about when we're setting stones is not just is it secure in this moment, but how is that piece going to be uh, functioning in five years or 10 years or 20 years? It really depends on the, the purpose of the piece, right? But one of the things that we really strive for in this program is to make sure that the work we're producing is going to last for a generation and that we know how to fix it when it's already lived its usefulness. That's great. Uh, how are we for time? We're, we're there. We have, um, we're at 158. Oh, 158. Wow. Yeah. So I don't know if we can tackle this question in two minutes, okay. but the, about uh, careers, pathways out of here. Okay. Um, so there are so many different careers in the jewelry industry and our graduates follow a lot of different paths. So we have folks working for really notable designers and manufacturers as their setters, as their technicians, as their polishers. We have folks who've gone out and they've started their own companies, both big and small. Um, and then we have folks doing repair work. Um, it really, it, it runs it runs the gamut. Um, we do have great support through um, the, our Office of uh, Student and Alumni Services. Um, we have a really robust job board. Um, oftentimes we have more positions on the job board than we have graduates. So lots and lots and lots of opportunities. It really is what you want to do with the skills when you go. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Anne. Hey, we have uh, Michelle Lois, uh, who is going to be giving a demonstration right after we leave here uh, in how to clean your jewelry safely and effectively uh, from home. Uh, so that's coming up. And then we're going to wrap up. Uh, Sarah and I are going to uh, say goodbye to everybody for now um, at the end of that. But I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody in jewelry making and repair. Um, thank you, Anne. Uh, Kristen, my co-host, and all of the students here in Jewelry Making and Repair, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks, that was great. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Those are Evans. Hey, Evans. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> So as I mentioned, Jewelry Making Repair uh, is an 18 month program. Uh, we have starts in Jewelry Making and Repair. Uh, the next one's coming up in February. We are still uh, taking applications. So if, if this is uh, for you, becoming a bench jeweler, uh, or if you know somebody who's interested, uh, send them our way. Um, this program has uh, been around in some form or another at North Bennett Street School for over a hundred years. Uh, the three programs that are in that category are uh, cabinet and furniture making, jewelry making, and carpentry, I believe. Um, check the website for uh, a ton of information on the school, on everything that we're doing. And uh, we're going to have Michelle join us right now. Uh, <laughs> Can everyone hear me and see me, <laughs> Rob? Yes? 
Hello everyone, I'm Michelle and I am an alum from the Jewelry Making and Repair program. I graduated in 2014 and just briefly I know there were questions about careers after the program and I, so right after graduating I, I worked for a jeweler in Boston doing production, so making her designs. And from there, I worked at the jeweler's building in downtown Boston doing diamond setting exclusively. And now I have a repair job doing um, a bunch of different stuff, lots of different repairs and custom work at a shop in Foxborough. I also have my own business on the side um, of custom work and selling directly to consumers from my website. So there's, there's lots of options. But anyway, I'm here to show you how to um, clean your jewelry at home because you would be surprised that you can give your jewelry a good cleaning with common household items. First, I'm going to show you how to clean very heavily tarnished sterling silver jewelry. See, everybody has some, some gross, black, yucky silver jewelry or flatware or something at home, and this is a great technique for it. Here I have a glass baking dish lined with aluminum foil, shiny side up. I'm going to lay my jewelry into this dish being careful that they do not touch or overlap. Now, the solution mixture for this cleaning is one tablespoon of baking soda. I'm just gonna sprinkle that in. One tablespoon of salt to one cup of boiling water. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pour in a cup of water. I think it's nice and bubbly. And you're gonna let this soak for about five to 10 minutes. And you can actually um, smell the chemical reaction that's taking place. Now that tarnish that's on your silver jewelry, that's sulfur. So right now, um, this, this chemical reaction, this process is kind of is dissolving all of that sulfur off of your jewelry. So it it does create a very lovely sulfur aroma. So while this is soaking, I'm gonna move on to another technique of cleaning jewelry. And this is great for pretty much every piece of jewelry you own. And that is hot water. And I'm gonna pour this into this little ramekin here with some dish soap. Dish soap is great because it has a degreasing agent. Um, it cuts through grease and the kind of dirt and grime that sticks to your jewelry is lotion and oils and dead skin cells. So um, dish soap or even Mr. Clean is great for this. And I have three rings here, all which were made at North Bennett. These are my student stone setting projects. I'm gonna give them a good cleaning. I'm gonna drop them here into the solution, let them soak for a little bit. In the meantime, let's check on our silver jewelry. You can see, remember how black they were? They're really starting to come clean, but they do need more time. So we'll let those go a little bit longer. I'm gonna take out my rings out of this soapy solution and really just give them a good brushing. I'm going to brush up towards the stones. And I'm sorry, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but you do want a soft toothbrush um, because you can scratch your metal or scratch like an opal or a pearl, something very delicate. Now you really want to, when cleaning, play, pay close attention to the gallery wire, which is something you just learned in that stone setting project. So the spaces below the stone. That's where gunk likes to collect. You also wanna give it a good scrubbing on the inside of your ring. You really wanna clean the, the parts that touch your skin because that's what makes it dirty. When you're done giving it a good scrub, I have a container of clean, cool 
rinsing water. I'm gonna put this over here and pat it dry on a nice soft cloth. You don't wanna use paper towels. They will scratch. I know, it's hard to believe something that soft can scratch your metal or a soft stone. So, so use a nice towel when drying. Now I'm gonna give these two rings a good scrubbing. So this ring has flush set stones. So you can't really clean these stones from the top. I mean, you can, but you're gonna get your best kind of cleaning by going with your toothbrush inside of this band and really kind of going to town underneath those stones because that's where dirt likes to collect, right? And then I'm gonna give this a rinse and pat it dry. And then I have one more solitaire here that I'm gonna give a good scrubbing. We get lots, lots of dirty jewelry at my repair job. And the first thing that we do when we take in a repair is we give it a good cleaning because you can't really work on, on dirty jewelry. You can't heat up dirty jewelry. Um, so we work exclusively on a nice clean jewelry. So these are nice and clean. And now that this water has cooled down a little bit, it's not boiling, you can um, give your pearls or anything that is strung um, on silk, you can give them a nice soak in warm, soapy water. So I would just put my pearls in there, leave them for about five to 10 minutes. And then when they're done, you cool them out and you gently dry them. That's it, no scrubbing on pearls or anything really that's strung because you could fray that very delicate silk string um, and you just, you just wanna be careful. Okay, now back to this part. You can see the silver jewelry is really starting to kind of turn back to its original silver color. This stuff was really dirty, so it does need to soak in here longer than the time that we have. But just, just to give you an example, um, a twist ring, actually, all of these rings were made in the uh, North Bennett program. So what I would do is I would take these out of this solution and rinse them under running water so that you, you don't have any bits of baking soda or salt stuck anywhere. Um, but I'm not at a sink, so I'm just going to use this little bowl of water here. Now I'm going to pat it dry. You can actually see some of the, the tarnish on this towel, which is great. It's doing a great job. Now this isn't as clean as I would like it, but for demonstration purposes, once it's cleaned and rinsed, I love one of these polishing cloths and you can get these at any big box retail store or Amazon. Um, we use them where I work and we use them at school at North Bennett. And what makes them great is they're, this cloth is actually impregnated with a um, polishing compound. So you can actually feel it. it feels a little bit greasy, but that's good. That's what's gonna make your jewelry nice and shiny. So then you're just gonna take your ring and. Kind of with, with moderate pressure, just give this ring a good, good polish. You can see it's kind of starting to come back to life a little bit and it's starting to see that beautiful white metal underneath. So with this particular cloth, you start with the dark side first. And then I'm gonna flip this over and give it an even finer polish with the yellow side. So there, and that's looking good. I'm gonna remove my pearls. Now again, they are strung on silk. So they do need to dry even further after you give them a nice, nice pack to dry. So I would just let them out to air dry. And then yeah, all of this stuff, all of these solutions are safe and can be disposed of down your regular um, sink drain. And this is actually a really great snow day project if you're gonna find yourselves in the part of the country tomorrow that's going to be snowed in. 
pull out your silver jewelry, your flatware, whatever, and get it, get it clean. Jewelry is a lot like owning a car where you, there are things you have to do to maintain it so that you can pass it on and wear it forever. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for your time. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I'm gonna turn the camera around now so I can see your questions. Hi. Okay, I don't see any questions, but thanks so much for joining me and good luck in North Bennett. It was the greatest decision I ever made. I can truly say that. Thank you. Oh, maybe I do see a Q&A. Oh, no. Okay. Michelle is a, a graduate of jewelry making and repair, and we're so grateful to have had so many, so many graduates uh, join us. And we just wanna say thank you uh, to everyone uh, who's joined us for, for Open House. Uh, I'm right here in the place uh, where we kick this off Monday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, in front of the sign, America's First Trade School. Uh, we are still running strong, and I'm here with uh, President uh, Sarah Turner. Uh, we're both um, here to just say thank you so much uh, for everyone for participating, uh, students, staff, uh, faculty, everyone out in the world uh, who has joined us uh, from all over the place. Thanks for uh, asking all your questions. Uh, we're gonna roll into the holidays, but the admissions and financial aid team uh, are really looking forward to working with anybody who's thinking of coming here uh, for full-time programs. Uh, just as a reminder, we've got four programs coming up this spring. That's uh, jewelry making and repair, which we visited today. Uh, that's violin making and repair, also visited today, uh, locksmithing and security technology, and uh, cabinet and furniture making. And then all nine full-time programs start again in September, and we have an extended uh, priority deadline to get your admissions files completed, which is February 1st. Uh, so again, thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, for coming and participating. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to President Sarah Turner. Rob, thank you so much. And I want to thank Rob for all of his work um, hosting all of us, uh, you out there in the world, us here at the school, for an incredible look at all of our full time programs, our community, our alumni community, our partners. Um, it's just been incredibly uh, exciting to see such a comprehensive view. And to Kristen Odell, his partner in hosting, and Kevin and Barbara and Sharon behind the scenes. It really has been an amazing um, thing to watch. And I just want to thank, too, our faculty and our students who are just so um, consistent and steadfast and inspiring in their work, their passion for their work, the way they just keep showing up every single day to take the next step forward into what they want for their lives and what they want for their learning. It is just so impressive. So you've seen a glimpse of the present. You've seen um, all of us here in the North End in Boston. 
you also are in some ways seeing a glimpse of our future because as you know, our mission is to train and advance uh, traditional crafts and trades in concert with evolving technologies. And I think no time like the present shows that intersection of the analog and the digital so um, fruitfully and so beautifully. And that really is a future for us to come as we continue to commit to being creative in digital learning and hands-on learning and the way those things intersect. And as we continue to commit to being a place that is inclusive and inspiring and welcoming to all, there is such a bright future. And I hope that you'll think about how to continue to be a part of it or how to join us. So Rob, thank you for an amazing three days. And thank you. Thank you to everyone from all over who came. Happy holidays, happy new year. Be well, keep well, and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you.